Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, October 9th, 2022. This is episode 1934. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Unify Meeting from Mimo Monitors. Unify simplifies your work life by combining your favorite video conferencing solutions into one reliable user interface. Visit unifymeeting.com and enter the code TECHGUY for 25% off a year's subscription or use the same code to get 25% off any of Mimo's 7-inch displays. And buy Cashfly. Deliver your video on the network with the best throughput and global reach making your content infinitely scalable. Go live in hours, not days. Learn more at cashfly.com. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yeah, it's time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smart watches. All that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number 888-827-827. 5536 toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada. If you're not in the US or Canada, well, here's some good news. You could just uh you could just use Skype out or something like that. You know, one of those internet doohickeys to call. And uh it shouldn't still shouldn't cost you anything. We do get calls from all over the world. It's fun. I like that. 8888 ask Leo, 888-827-5536. The lines are open, as they say. Website, techguylabs.com. That's a good thing to know about because that's where uh, all the information you hear on the show is going to show up. We put it, we call the show notes. We put the show notes up there for free. No sign up, you know, just wander in. There's no, somebody asked about a login page yesterday. There's no, there's no, I don't know where he was, but there's no login page on ours. So don't worry about it. Just go to techguylabs.com. And uh, this is episode 1934. Very good year. Very good episode, I hope. We'll find out, won't we? And then audio and video of the show will be put up there at techilabs.com and uh, the show notes and uh, transcript, all that stuff. Good news if you... Uh, do you... Uh, I'm wondering... What do we... <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a big confession here. Uh, I and my friends, my ilk, the geeks... Whenever I'm doing a show, you know, I do a bunch of other podcasts for like hardcore enthusiasts like Windows Weekly. You know, it's all about Windows, Paul Theron, Mary Jo Foley or Mac Break Weekly. Or, you know, I do all these shows for, you know, people really like into it, enthusiasts. And when I mention this show, the radio show I do, I always say the normal people listen to the radio show. I hope that's not offensive, but it just <laughs> you're good. No, you're normal. It's not, it is we who are not normal. We are the, you know, the, we care abnormally about all this stuff and think about it all the time and all that stuff. The enthusiasts, but but one of the reasons it's really great to do this show is to connect with real people in the real world and understand that their view of what's going on in technology is often very different from how you know we nerds, we geeks think about it. I'll give you an example. Well, actually, I'm actually actually asking you as a normal person what you think. Uh. When you surf around, whether it's on your phone or your computer, you go to a website, you see that thing pops up that says, hey, we use cookies on this website. And then sometimes it says, you know, what's your preference? Sometimes it doesn't even say that. It just says, you want to know more? Click this link. Otherwise, say OK. The the infamous cookie consent banner. Have you no? Just out of curiosity. Do you, do you, you notice that, right? How annoying is it to you? It's very annoying to me. <laughs> it, it comes from European regulations, European uh, privacy regulations. And it really comes from a complete misunderstanding of how the Internet works. Euro European privacy regulations, I, I'm essentially all four. I mean, privacy, yeah, good thing. Not a bad thing. Good thing. But they had decided some years ago to demonize cookies. And I think a lot of people... You, Again, speaking as a geek, <laughs> we kind of know what those are all about. But I think a lot of people, normal people probably go, yeah, cookie's bad. Uh, and so 
the theory, I guess, is this site is now warning you, well, we use them. Good luck. Have fun. Because they're required by law to do so only for Europeans, but it's such a pain. You don't, very few sites say, well, is this person from Europe? Okay, I'll show it. Otherwise, I won't. They just go, yeah, pop it up. It's too hard to be sure if somebody's coming in from a country covered by those regulations. So, you know, pretty much all websites do it. The cookie consent banner. Uh, just, you know, for background, just to fill you in a little bit, it's a complete waste of time. It's completely stupid. <laughs> it's a, in fact, it's probably a bigger, get this, a bigger violation of privacy than the cookie. What are cookies? I guess we need to understand what cookies are. So when you have a program, you're working on a, you know, Microsoft Word document or, you know, you're you know, you're playing Candy Crush or whatever. Uh, when you close Candy Crush or Facebook and then reopen it, it knows who you are and where you are, right? It knows how many, what level you're on and things like that, right? How does it do that? Cookies. It's it, it, In a program on your computer, it's called preferences or save settings or, you know, save my current situation kind of thing. So when you're using, playing Candy Crush on your PC, it just saves that to the hard drive. When you're on a website, same thing. When you're on Facebook, it saves a cookie on your computer that says who you are so you don't have to log in every single time. And if you want to know what these cookies do, it's easy. You go in your browser, clear all the cookies, and then you'll see you have to log in again to every site. You have a lot of stuff that the sites don't remember about you, your trouser size or what level of candy crush you're on, that kind of thing. That's what those are. They're, they're simply preferences. And, 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 and really, uh, they've been around since the web started. The technical term for them is persistent client-side state information, P-C-S-S-I, which really annoys me because they could have called them pixies and everybody would have been much happier. But because that's P-C-S-S-I, persistent client-side state information. State is your state, your state of being, your state of your, your, the current state of your program. You're saving it. And it's persistent. So when you come back, and it's on client-side because... You're the client, and it saves it locally. It doesn't save it on their site. It saves it locally. You're not going to save. Facebook's not going to save all those settings. You know, it saves some on their website, but most of them, it's on yours. Okay. So it's useful. It's necessary, frankly. Uh, there are a, There is a potential privacy problem with cookies because, you know, when they were designed, they were originally designed by Netscape, by Mozilla for the Netscape uh, browser. Remember Netscape? Uh, and, and, and you know, very early on in the mid-90s when the people started using the web, they realized, oh, we really need a way to kind of remember your state so when you come back, you know, it's not who the hell are you. It's, hi, welcome back. That's nice, right? Unfortunate. And, and when they were designed, they, they knew that there'd be a privacy concern. So the rule is the only site that can look at those cookies is the site that saved them. Only Facebook can look at Facebook's cookies. That's, an, that's sensible. But, of course, Facebook being Facebook and other companies, you know, they want to, they'd like to know where everywhere you go on the web. Let's say you're a, a coffee shop, Buckstar's coffee shop, and uh, and you know that a lot of people go to Unkin' No Nuts. And so you want to know, <laughs> Buckstar wants to know when you go to Unkin'. And, uh, but how would they know that? Well, and here's where Facebook came in and Google and others. Uh, it turns out when you go to Unkin from, from Buckstars, Unkin doesn't, doesn't know what you, what, what your favorite Aparino Frecciatino was, but Unkin might have a Facebook like button on there. Oh, that's interesting. That Facebook like button is like a little teeny weeny web page. <laughs> And it's a loophole because it means now Facebook is open on that site and can save a cookie, can look at cookies. So suddenly if Buckstars and Unkins both have Facebook like buttons, Unkins can see that you've been to Uck Buckstars and that you like the Uchapino Wattapine. So <laughs> that's what we call third party cookies. There is actually no such thing as a third party cookie. 
But it's the idea that you uh, th you might be able to tell as a third party where people have been. Uh, put enough like buttons on the web. Facebook knows everywhere you've been. In fact, that's the whole idea behind the like button. And then later, of course, the Facebook login and the Google login and the Twitter login. They're all just trying to figure out where you go. So we call them third party cookies. And technically, they're not. They're still first party cookies. So that's the privacy uh, damn, you know, risk. Is yeah, That's not a good thing. The cookie banners <laughs> don't do anything about that by the way <laughs> they just they just they make you feel good uh, except they don't because trillions of man hours human hours are wasted kicking clicking those banners they get in the way they're really bad on mobile because you don't have a lot of screen real estate anyway they're just an annoyance and in the long run they just make you go fine 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 cookies 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 i don't care anymore enough with the cookies and there's even a privacy potential because those cookie consent banners hit you before any cookies are set that's the rule right but they themselves can be monitoring you so they could be worse than a cookie okay fine this is all a long way around to say that browsers now are starting to block cookies hallelujah it's probably illegal in europe you europeans don't use brave but brave is announcing that it will soon allow users to block those annoying cookie consent banners. And frankly, if you use a uh, uh, ad blocker, as many do, uh, you often can set those to block those banners too. That's, that's why this law was stupid. Because A, it served no purpose. It annoys people, wastes a lot of bandwidth, wastes a lot of time, is potentially privacy invasion, and then ultimately teaches people <laughs> how to use ad blockers and other technologies to turn them off exactly the opposite of the intent of the eu congratulations you're big winners in the stupid law category anyway I, that was a I, sorry about the long explanation all to merely say the brave is going to start doing that <laughs> enough 88 88 ask leo i've wasted my whole first segment explaining cookies but now you know right i think it's a good thing to know and as a normal person, does this annoy you? Sure annoys me, and I'm not normal. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. No, I want to see you now. <laughs> telephone operator, why don't I? Hello, telephone operator. Hello. Hi. I, when I want to get you, <laughs> that's Kim Schaffer, the phone angel. I want to get you the headset. Yes. With the, you know, old-fashioned microphone on the, and then, uh, Maybe like some some uh, jacks that you can plug into a switchboard. Oh, then you'd that, be a telephone. That would operator. be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, who is, is this? this? The person to whom I'm speaking. <laughs> <laughs> is this the person? <laughs> Hello. So Kim does a, such a good job, and you, you her laugh isn't it great? Uh, <sighs> people love your laugh. Uh, she answers the phone. She's the person who prepares you for your appearance on national radio. Yes. Do you have? Have you prepared someone? I me. think that I have. Are they ready? There's a couple of people. <laughs> Who shall I? Let's go to Rod in L.A. and not our Rod, but a different Rod. Another Rod. Another a, Rod. A in lightning LA. Rod, if you will, for technology problems. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Rod. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, I I got a I got a question for you. I'm not sure if it's uh, solvable or not, but I have a. Uh, I think it's like a four terabyte portable hard drive. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those ones that looks a little bit like a large deck of cards. Yeah. And uh, it was kind of working fine. And all of a sudden, one day, it just stopped being recognized by the computer. Yeah. And I plugged it into multiple computers and multiple. So usually that's and... not the drive. Could be. There's a lot of things that can fail. But that's a USB enclosure that you have. And inside that, if you open it up, you'd actually see there's a little drive. Or sometimes for big ones, two drives. And uh, the drives may be just fine, but the USB circuitry or even the USB cable could be bad. So yeah, I tried different cables, too. Good, yeah. So that's how we fix problems. We troubleshoot them by doing the easy things first. So the easy thing is, well, let's just see. Yeah. You did, you're good. You you, tr you did, let's try it on some other computers. No, no go. So it's not the computer. Try some other cables. No go. Okay, so it's not the cable. So now we know it's that enclosure and that drive. So two things could have gone wrong. There's circuitry in the enclosure that takes the output of the drive, which is ATA or SATA, 
and turns it into USB. So there's some, some circuitry that does that. You can get try. What I would do next is try, uh, take the drives out. Now, if it's two drives, that's problematic because then there's some RAID software and the firmware of the enclosure. And usually that's proprietary. And it means the contents of the drives will be kind of unreadable without some extra effort. But if it's just a single drive in there, and it probably is, four terabytes isn't huge. Uh, these days. It is huge, but it's not these So if it's just a single drive, you take it out of the enclosure, there'll be little screws. Sometimes you have to pry the rubber feet off the bottom to get to the screws, but there'll be little screws. You can take it out. And then... Well, this has no screws on it either. It's... Well, it could, like, I guess it could be glued. Pry off the cover of it. I guess it be, could be glued. Who makes it? Uh, Western Digital. Okay. So, look, yeah, there. you know, sometimes there's a release. There's a way to get into it. If you have to pry it with a screwdriver... I hate to do that because that'll probably damage the case. But it, but if you really want the data... The, I don't need to keep the drive. I just want to get the information. You want the it. data, of course. That's what's important. Yeah. So uh, if you go to... There are a number of companies that make these. Uh, newer Tech uh, is the one I usually send people to. N-E-W-E-R-T-E-C-H. They make a USB adapter, which is a, just... A, it's actually a good thing to have around if you're a geek. Uh, they call it the Universal Drive Adapter. It's about 50 bucks. And it has... It's just a cable, USB cable on one end, and then there's a big dongle on the other end that has all sorts of connectors for drives and stuff. And so you can connect it to any two and a half, three and a half, or five and a quarter inch drive, whatever. It's got the circuitry inside the dongle to do it USB. So it's a it, you wouldn't want to use it all the time because the drive is out in the air exposed, but it's really good for this kind of situation. Now, if it's the drive, this isn't going to solve it, and it's hard to know if it's the drive or not. The fact that... When you plug it in, usually if it's the drive, you'll still see the USB interface. You just won't be able to access the data. The fact that it's not showing up, to me, usually means that the USB is what's broken. That's good news because that's easily fixed. Okay, okay. So get yeah, the... When I, when, I, when I do plug it in, you know, some, when you plug these things in, yeah. the computer will oftentimes give it's you a little ding-dong kind of... Yeah, kinda, yeah. Yeah. It's doing that. Yeah. But then nothing happens. Okay, that's interesting. Um... Well, that means it sees there's a USB device connected, but it but it's I I still think that that sounds like it's a USB. It's hey, it's worth forty five bucks to find out, right? And actually, uh, the chat room's putting some links to even cheaper devices. I just have never tried them. Uh, and also, oh, good, thank you, Twisted Mister. A link to, to whatthetech.com, how to open a Western Digital enclosure. Nice. Oh. See, the chat room is good at this stuff. So, how do, I, how do I actually get to your chat room? I've tried that a couple of times. Haven't any I? web browser, go to irc.twit.tv. IRC is Internet Relay Chat. That's the old, 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 old school chat. Predates the World Wide Web, actually. It's that old. Uh, irc.twit, which is my podcast uh, site, TWIT is This Week in Tech.tv. And you can do it in a browser, but there's also instructions there if you want to, if you really are old school and you want to use one of them old school IRC clients it tells you how to do that too but uh, I will put both these links in the show notes as well if you if you can wait <laughs> sure how to open a western digital enclosure yes yeah, screwdriver narrow ultra thin flathead or credit card oh uh, yeah see there is there is a, there's a hook and a thing and a jingadabanga but you can get into it I think without damaging it and then once you're into it get one of those connecting devices Put it in the computer, and if it still doesn't show up, yeah, then it's the hard drive. Then it's a whole nother story. Sam Abul Samad coming up, Car Guy, right after this. So you know, then it's it's a data recovery issue. Ooh, what's this? Oh, this is that kind of Western Digital. Yeah, the boy that uh, that looks like you'd have to pry it open. Is it? Is it? It's like a really small one. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, it looks like a deck of cards, but it's kind of like a wide deck of cards. Yeah, that's what this is. This is the uh, passport. Um, yeah, I think you'd have to. Yeah, I'll, that's it. Yep, I think you. Mine's probably, a little thicker than that, is all. You'd probably have to pry it open. I bet you can. I mean, you're going to damage the case because it's just plastic. So. Yeah. Um, I don't really care about the case. But once once you get that drive out, and this is if it, these are a two and a half inch laptop drives, so you can just plug that in. They get power and data on one cable 
Uh, the uh, newer tech can handle that. So can probably these $11 versions. Uh, I just have never tried them. I have the newer tech and I use it all the time. It's very handy. You yeah. wouldn't want to leave you wouldn't want to leave the drive out with its ex, you know exposed uh, forever, but for copying right. that data off that's exactly what you want. Then if the drive's dead, okay, now it's a different matter. You got to, you know, spin right and various drive recovery tools and so forth. And it may just be non-functioning. You know, sometimes drives just die. There's a lot of heat if you think about this case. Uh, it doesn't dissipate heat real well, right? So right. The, the drives are these are these are hard on drives. <clears throat> no fan, very tight enclosure, uh, and this is because it's not metal. It's really not a lot, a lot of maybe yours is aluminum. I don't know. This feels like plastic. It doesn't. It's not going to transmit a lot of heat. So Western Digital, they don't care. They want you. They want them to die because they want you to buy another one. <laughs> Good old Western Digital. Um, okay, so I will try that, and then otherwise, uh, like I, you know, I, I went to Western Digital website, and they basically said, okay, here's these companies that can help you get the information. Yeah, off. so like drive savers, but it's that's like very, bucks. very, very expensive, thousands yeah. of dollars. And it's not worth that. The, the information not worth that. Yeah, to us, so. yeah. they have <laughs> drive savers is a hoot. They have uh, grief counselors <laughs> that you call, and they'll help you, but it's expensive because what they're going to do is rebuild the drive. I mean, the, the, yeah, just the best thing to do is uh, get this, this drive adapter. You'll use it again. I keep it in a drawer. It's always handy because drives die. It's a way to connect them. And if it's just the USB interface, this will fix it. If it's the drive itself, you, you know, you can get spin right. You have to now. You have to mount it on a SATA adapter because it has to be fully accessible. USB hides a lot of the details, and so you need something like you need a computer you can attach it to directly with yeah. eSATA or something. So spin right. That's a that's that's my friend Steve Gibson's program, GRC.com. It's ninety bucks, so it's more expensive than a new drive. But if there's data, you got to have. That's the first thing I would. That's after you get the drive out and it doesn't work. <laughs> but if, but you know what? They don't even buy that. If you put this in a computer on a SATA connector and you can't see it, SpinRight won't help. SpinRight's only if you can see it, but it's limping along and you can't read from it. And, you know, it says this drive is un... If it says this drive is unformatted, then SpinRight. But if it doesn't even see a drive with a SATA, direct SATA, not USB, but direct SATA connection uh, of the drive, then it means the whole thing is kablooey. And you, okay. you probably should have had a backup. <laughs> hey, I'm, hey, Rod, I hope that helps. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, Sammy. Hello, Leo. Where are you today? I'm at home in Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti. Tomorrow I'll be in Nashville. Oh, fun. What, do, then, what, what uh, will you be driving in Nashville? The new Toyota Crown. Oh, fun. Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. Hey, I do want to tell you about a great deal on a product you probably need. It's called Unify Meeting. It comes from a company called Mimo Monitors. They are the global experts in video conferencing solutions. And they've solved a problem I have, and I bet a lot of you have. With hybrid work, remote work, we're spending time, a lot of it, at home and on the road in Zoom calls, in Google Meeting calls. In Microsoft Teams calls, right? And often all three. I mean, look at your computer. Do you have all three installed? You probably do. I do. Running all the time, right? And there's a problem because each one has a different user interface, a different setup. It's very confusing. In fact, I've, I've told this story before, but it happens every time. we At work, we use Google Meet internally. We use Zoom for our calls uh, and occasionally uh, with Premiere, Premiere uses Teams. I'll be talking to Premiere on Teams. Zoom and Google Meet. So Google, so Zoom has a button that's to unmute your microphone. Google Meet has a button to hang up. It looks the same, and it's in the same place. So invariably, when I get on the company group calls. I hang up because I think I'm unmuting, I'm muting my mic because it's the same place. It's confusing, right? Wouldn't it be nice to have a single user interface for all your video calls? That's what Unify Meeting does. It eliminates the frustration. 
takes the guesswork out. It's reliable every time. The buttons and the commands are always in the same place, whether using Zoom, Teams, or Meet. By itself, just by itself, that single thing would be the most valuable, but it's better. It's even more because it's a little calendar that sits on your desktop, knows about all your meetings. We, If it's time for a meeting, you click the link on the calendar on the Unify meeting thing, and it launches the right software. So it knows. It always looks the same to you. You don't even have to know, but it knows. It launches Zoom or Teams or Meet, and you're in the meeting. Makes it very easy to see your daily schedule, your upcoming meetings. It makes it very easy to join the meetings in a standard UI. Now, honestly, by itself, that's great. It's even better if you have a second or third display. Takes up a little real estate. Your calendar is always there. It's like your little calendar display. When you're on a meeting, there's the meeting. And Mimo monitors sells those little extra USB displays, including their 7-inch, which is perfect for this, right? So Unify Meeting runs. It's at the calendar there. You click there. That's where the meeting is. In fact, if you use the 7-inch Mimo display or the external Mimo display, Teams or Zoom or Meet will be launched in its normal UI on your big screen. So if you need that, you still have it. But the meeting itself is hold, held on the little monitor. Isn't that cool? It's really a perfect best of both worlds scenario. Unify runs on Windows. It's PC compatible. $35.88 for a whole year. And if you buy any Mimo monitor, it's free. It comes with a monitor. So I here's here's the call to action. I want you to try Unify for your team at work or try it for yourself at home. Go to unifymeeting.com. U-N-I-F-Y-M-E-E-T-I-N-G. Unifymeeting.com. Uh, use the offer code tech guy if you would helps us out they know you saw it here and you'll get a benefit you get 25 percent off a year's subscription or use the offer code tech guy and get 25 percent off any mimos seven inch displays and you get unify meeting with that for free that's what i would do personally in fact, that's what i did simplify with unify unifymeeting.com use the offer code tech guy 25 percent off a year's subscription or 25 percent off any of mimos seven inch displays simplify with unify thank you unify meeting for supporting the tech guy show and now on we go it's time for sam abul samad principal <coughs> researcher at uh, guidehouse insights host of wheel bearings the great wheel bearings podcast and our car guy my car guy hi sam hello leo how are you today i'll tell you how much of a car guy he is he's in ypsilanti michigan that's how much of a car. Is everybody in Ypsilanti a car guy? Maybe not. Uh, no, not no. not at all. No. <laughs> but but this you know this area has been a uh, a central hub of the auto industry for better part of a century. We actually have uh, a little museum here in town called the Ypsilanti Automotive Heritage Museum that is dedicated to many of the brands that were built in this area. Uh, is it near Dearborn, where the big Rouge River plant is? It, it, it's we're about. Uh, 28 miles okay, west so there's of probably workers the, the Rouge. from from Rouge yeah. that, that live but, there. I mean, we've we've had car plants here um you know, we had um the Corvair was built here oh. at the uh, Willow Run assembly plant there you go. um but also before that the Tucker was built oh, here oh nice um the uh, uh oh what am I blanking on the name of the brand was Tucker handmade um, I feels like it might have been handmade they they were pretty much yeah, I mean they yeah. only made like 52 I yeah, think so they yeah. were all pretty much hand built uh, but there, there are quite a few brands that were built right in this area here. Uh, so it's it, it's a pretty cool area for for automotive history. So I see you sitting in front of a Ford charging cable, and uh, I would guess it's being plugged into a Ford vehicle, electric vehicle. That's my mm -hmm. guess. I'm just guessing. Yeah. And the, the reason why I've got this particular image, uh, this is an example of using uh, the Ford Charge Station Pro with uh, the F-150 Lightning um, to because that system has what's known as bidirectional power capability. Oh, that's and cool. this is oh, that's and cool. this is so you can use it to back up your house if your power goes out. But you can also do a lot of other interesting things with it. So and we this have is, a number of electric vehicles, as you know, and mm -hmm. in our case, all we did is we put in one of those RV or dryer outlets, a NEMA 1450, which you see, those are commonplace. It has yeah, to that's have, what I have in my garage. Yeah, it has to have more, it has to have a 40 amp circuit behind it. Mm -hmm. 
And then I bought, I went out and I just bought uh, Grizzly, makes them, but a lot of companies make them, just a little box that plugs into that and then plugs into your car. And and so that's all we did. But this Ford thing has a lot more capabilities. I, the only reason I mention that is a lot of companies, Tesla too, sell very expensive <laughs> charging things that you don't you don't necessarily need, right? Right. Um, you know, mo most EVs come with a charging cable in the vehicle. Um, that you that, can usually plug and, into and, a NEMA fourteen fifty in many. Yeah, cases. and, and yeah. Uh, originally, early on, uh, they were they would only those were only for plugging into a one twenty volt standard. Yes, yeah, the, volt one, household the bolt light. when we got but it they, a couple of years ago came with a normal plug, and if you, right. if you plug into the wall like your regular normal plug, it take you about three days to charge yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah. really slow. <laughs> but um, yeah, now a lot of automakers are starting to include uh, 240 or uh, actually they're including cables that have an interchangeable tip on them. Yeah. So that you can plug it into either a 120 volt outlet or a 240 if you have one. So it's you can plug it into a NEMA outlet. When you get yeah. an electric vehicle, like what do you, because sometimes they, it, they it's an upsell, they'll charge you extra. Right. But um, those are mainly just unidirectional. So they will send electrons from your household circuit into right. your battery in the car. That's what's interesting about this. So this, this, was, this is bi-directional. Yeah. So this is this has a lot of extra electronics in it mm -hmm. to do that, right? Right. And you also need some extra circuitry in the car as well. So the onboard charger in the vehicle also has to have bi-directional capability so oh, you can send it out. I thought all um, electric vehicles could do that. So this box no. is an in, what they call an inverter, right? That takes the... Well, no, the, this this particular box is not an inverter. Oh. Uh, so this uh, this works in conjunction with an inverter. So oh, you when you buy a inverter. Lightning, you get this particular wall box with the truck. It comes comes bundled with it. Uh, and then you have to buy a, a separate smart inverter that uh. has a transfer switch. Um, because the power coming out of your, out of your truck is DC. Um, and so you need to convert that to AC for your house. Right. Um, and so what we're starting to see now is more and more vehicles that are equipped with bi-directional onboard chargers. So they can also put out power, put power out. Uh, so Ford's done this. Um, the Nissan Leaf has actually had this for, for quite a while because the Chatamo charging standard, the, it's a Japanese charging standard that they use on the Leaf. Um, has always or has long had support for bi-directional capability. It's just now becoming standardized with CE, with CCS, the which is the the typical standard used here in North America. And uh, so what we're going to start seeing is a lot more vehicles coming to market with bi-directional charging capability. So you'll be able to do things like when your power goes out, power your house off of that the, idea. the vehicle battery. Yeah. Or uh, there's there's a, a test going on right now that PG&E is doing and a couple other utilities are doing similar tests with some new EVs where the, the Ford system right now, it's managed locally at, at your home so that um, that inverter uh, when it detects a power outage, it automatically switches over. So it's not feeding power back into the grid. But um, some what uh, PG&E is doing with both GM and Ford is they're testing a system where they can manage it remotely. So when they're reaching peak loads on the grid and there's a, 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 a chance that they may have to start doing rolling blackouts or brownouts, then what they can do is reach out to vehicles that are opted in um, and switch those over. And if they're plugged in, they can switch, switch those over for some period of time for, you know, maybe a couple of hours or so, uh, to power those homes off of that and take those homes off the grid temporarily to reduce the load so they, they can avoid the, the blackouts. Um, and this is something you're going to see more of going forward. This is one of the things that utilities are looking at as ways to manage, you know, when vehicles are charged, you know, when, and, and, uh, be able to distribute power more reliably. Um, but then, you know, the next stage of that is actually feeding power back into the grid. And um, right now, none of the consumer vehicles have that, are going to have that capability. Well, none of the consumer equipment has that capability. But what we're starting to see now is electric school buses. And they are equipping uh, bus garages with um with equipment that can actually feed power back into the grid when needed. And school buses are a great use case for this because of how buses are used you know, during the day. They're typically out on runs in the morning, out on runs in the afternoon. Most of the rest of the time, they're sitting in the bus barn doing nothing. And so, and they're just um, big you know, old batteries just sitting and there. And they're big, big batteries sitting there. And so there's an opportunity there 
to send power back into the grid when it's not needed by the bus. Um, and that can generate some revenue for the, dis the school district that's running those buses and also make the grid more resilient. So um, this week, um, you know, we talked last week, I think, about Volvo uh, making some announcements about some of the interior sensing capabilities they're doing. They're continuing to trickle out information on their new EX90 EV that's going to be re released next month or revealed next month. Uh, the latest thing is bidirectional charging capability. It will have that built in. The Lucid Air has that. Um, the uh, VW ID Buzz has this, and most of GM's uh, new EVs coming out will also have this if they have the optional higher power uh, onboard chargers. They'll have that bi-directional capability. So this is something you're going to see a lot more of in the coming years. Yeah, very cool. I have yeah. uh, two of those big Tesla Powerwall batteries in my house because... Yeah, and this is basically same doing idea. the same job as a yeah. Powerwall, yeah. except it's mobile. And yeah. it, it's actually a lot bigger. Like the... You know, the Lightning has a 131 kilowatt hour battery, nice. whereas your power walls are seven kilowatt hours each. Yeah. So it can, you know, the light, a Lightning can keep your home running for several days. Hey, settle uh, a unlike, bet for us in the chat. Yeah. Is a battery or gasoline vehicle a higher risk in terms of explosion uh, and fire? Uh, so the chances of having a fire with a gasoline vehicle are much higher, but. If you have a fire with an, with a battery, it's much harder to ex extinguish because the so it's, the battery yeah. is actually providing oxygen, so you can't just put yes. water on. Yep. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I don't know if you settled the bet, but you certainly <laughs> informed. Sam, <laughs> as, as usual, Sam it's not an easy answer. Wheelbearings It depends. <laughs> Electric vehicles don't catch fire nearly as much as gas vehicles. Actually, hybrids are the most dangerous, which is interesting, followed by gas vehicles. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, when, when this whole thing with the Bolt uh, battery fires was occurring, I, I looked up some, some data uh, from the National Fire Protection Association, and, you know, I think there were eight or nine Bolt battery fires. Right. Um, and in 2019... There was about two hundred and twenty thousand car fires, gasoline car fires, um, and when you when you do it, you know, on a per cap, you know, number of vehicles out That's there true. on the road. That's true. It, it works out that the chances of having a battery fire um, are less than one tenth of the chances of a fire with an EV. Right. Now that said. There was um, somebody earlier in the chat had mentioned, you know, there was a report out of Florida this week that there were a number of Tesla vehicles that were catching That's fire after up. Hurricane Ian. Yeah, because yeah. they got water damage. Yeah. How does that right. happen? And, well, it's, the problem is the salt water. It's not so much water damage. So, I mean, fresh water, not a problem. But the salt water causes a lot more corrosion. It can get uh, into places where it shouldn't be. Um, and I, back a decade ago, when Hurricane Sandy hit the Northeast, um, Fisker Automotive, the first iteration of Fisker Automotive, they had um, something like 250 cars that had just come off a boat that were sitting in the port in New Jersey. And the port got flooded. Oh, I remember that. Um, yeah. During the hurricane. And um, I think about 10 or 20 of those cars caught fire. Again, for the same thing, salt water getting into places and the minerals in the salt water causing short circuits. Um, so salt water is a lot higher risk factor than fresh water. Um, fresh water, generally not, you know, vehicle EVs can go through fresh water without any issues. You know, that's why you can, you can take a Rivian, you know, and drive it through 30 inches of water without a problem. But, um, you don't want to do that, um, with salt water. You don't want to take, you don't want to take it to an ocean beach, uh, if you can avoid it. Cause that, that corrosive material in there is, is very bad. Now this is, um, you know, one of the things that major automakers do as part of their durability testing is they do a lot of saltwater intrusion testing. You know, they'll they'll run vehicles through uh, a big, long salt bath thousands of times during their durability testing uh, regime. And, you know, I don't think that uh, some companies that will remain unnamed necessarily are quite that rigorous with their durability testing. Um, you know, cause so far all of the incidents I've seen in Florida 
have all been involved Teslas, not uh, not any other brand of EVs. So I don't know if there's a, a particular Tesla problem with saltwater intrusion um, or if, if it's a more general problem. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that that is definitely something to uh, to consider. Um, let's see. <laughs> Redacted something like 20,000 luxury cars under the sea. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, earlier uh, this year, there was a, a car, car car hauler um, that caught fire in the Atlantic uh, coming over from Europe. It was carrying about 2000 yeah. uh, Volkswagen group vehicles, yeah, some, uh, a bunch of VWs, Audis, uh, Lamborghinis, Bentleys. Uh, and it went down in the middle of the Atlantic after there was a fire uh, that, uh, some of the vehicles on there were EVs and, and they caught fire and it really exacerbated. I mean, it made it a lot harder to put out the, uh, yeah. the fire. Yeah. Sam, you want to stick around for the top? Uh, unfortunately, I can't. I've got to go run a couple of errands. No problem. So um, I will week. talk to you next week. See you next week. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. A little bit of rock and roll. A little bit of... But that would be a good song, maybe. I'm a little bit of a geek. You're a little bit of a nerd. Let's get together and start a Comic-Con. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Jay on the line from Columbia, South Carolina. Hi, Jay. How you doing, Leo? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. The long-time listener, first-time caller. I always enjoy listening to a lot of your different podcasts while I'm busy working. It makes the day go by nicely. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we don't um, bore you over, uh, over time. <laughs> I'll try to keep it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Uh, makes the day go by quickly. Yeah, um, good. My wife got a job in England, and we're moving over there in a couple weeks. How exciting! We're, I, we were very excited about it, um, but uh, it's a you know it can it can be uh, as short as three years, but it, it, we could go longer. But all my family members have their phone numbers that they've had for quite a long time, and we want to keep them. Um, when we return to the States and I was trying to figure out the best way to do that. Can we port them to like a Google voice service? You and could, I wouldn't way? recommend it. You should ask the phone company that provides those numbers if they'll put them on hold for you. Uh, most of the time you could okay. say, look, I'm, I'm going to be out of the country for three years. That's a long time, but ask if they'll hold those for you. Uh, and then if they okay. say, well, we can't guarantee it for three years, by the way, they may say we want those numbers, but from th three years from now, I doubt they'll still they'll want those numbers. But uh, then you can do that. You can uh, port, do international number porting. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to do it to something like Google Voice or Twilio. So if you look for international number porting, you know, you can't go, obviously, you know, a, a U.S. number with a U.S. area code is not going to work in jolly old, but... There are, right. you can port it to submit to various internet providers. But I'd first ask the phone company if they'd hold it for three years. A lot of times, they, you know, they yep. hope to get you back. Uh, the other thing yes, you should uh, know is that in almost in all likelihood, you won't be using text messaging in the UK. You'll be using WhatsApp. So you might as well get the family used to that. Especially the younger people probably don't care so much about phone numbers. They care about messaging. And uh, text okay. messaging is is big still in the U.S., but almost everywhere else in the world, they use uh, one of these internet messaging services like Facebook Messenger. Uh, in Japan, they use Line. In uh, China, they use WeChat, and most of the world uses WhatsApp. Uh, so, uh, yeah, man, you know, th th that's the other thing you'll notice is uh, that the iPhone, which is much more dominant here is about 50 percent uh of the market here much less so uh, in other countries i don't know what it's like in the uk but much less so internationally a lot more android phones a lot more samsung phones in particular uh but yeah so that's and you know that's that whole problem if you're an apple user if your friends aren't using iphones uh they're a little bit of at a disadvantage you know they're they're that that awful stinky green bubble or whatever it is blue bubble so so i would i would about uh in the uk i'm just looking at some stats 80 percent use whatsapp so that is okay. by far the biggest i do see it's interesting uh some usage of facetime and imessage but facetime's only 30 percent of the market imessage is only 22 percent of the market so 
you know, the reason people use WhatsApp is historic mostly because text messaging, messaging uh, used to be very expensive around the world. It was here too, uh, but it's now essentially free here. Still can be expensive mm -hmm. worldwide. So they use WhatsApp uh, because it's just data. In the, so, and it's free. And, it, and by the way, it works great on Android and iOS. So if you can get your mm -hmm. family members, especially the younger ones, onto WhatsApp... Yeah, we've we've used it before. We've had one of my oldest stepdaughter went to Panama uh, last year for school, and we use WhatsApp to communicate with her. With exactly. That. So exactly. We've yeah. we've been doing that for a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, so I think that that's you know that's probably the most practical shift. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So. We don't. We want the the phone company to hold our numbers. Hopefully, they'll hold. Yeah, them first, call, first. call them up and see what their policy is. They all have a policy of, uh, and this is mostly for military, right? Very common. Yeah. Somebody get deployed okay. overseas, and uh, they will hold your number as you go overseas, and then when you come home, you can get it back. Who's your carrier? Okay. Uh, Verizon. Yeah, I would ask them. You know, uh, different carriers have different. You you're with a champagne price carrier so i would hope that they would yeah. be good they want you back right they don't want you to come home and say oh yeah i don't need you anymore so uh yeah i called them asked them if i canceled you know we have five lines in our service and just to hold one line for the oldest daughter who's finishing up college she, she's going to be here for another half semester um it was like 80 dollars for yikes. one line so i yikes. switched her to mint money, 15 bucks a month there you go Smart. So I'm looking at the Verizon's page. To hold your mobile number, we make your mobile number inactive by suspending service for a maximum of three years and 90 days. Don't know why that number, mm -hmm. but that might work out. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a common uh, period of time for deployment. I don't know. Well, suspended, your mobile number will not be able to obviously make or receive calls or access the Verizon wireless network. You basically take that SIM out of that phone. You're going to be using wireless, you know, Verizon. If you want calls to come in, though, that's a good use of something like Google Voice or Twilio or TrueCaller. There are a whole bunch of uh, voice over internet systems that you could port that number to. The problem is getting them back sometimes is tricky. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, I'll yeah. put a link in the show notes to how to suspend and reconnect your Verizon wireless service for you. Uh, cool. Three, All three. Right. you know, if, if I'm telling you, it's probably enough because after three years, Everybody's going to go, oh, nobody ever calls that number anyway. <laughs> You've been gone long enough. They've forgotten about you. They don't. <laughs> not. Come back and have a new number. <laughs> uh, that's going to be fun. What part of England are you going to be in? Uh, kind of near um, uh, two, about an hour and a half northeast of London, uh, nice. near Cambridge, kind of. Sounds like fun. Sounds like an adventure, family oh, yeah. adventure. Absolutely. Yeah, the kids are 13, 16, and 20, so perfect age to oh, be over yeah. there to travel. Although the 13-year-old may not think so. Daddy, you're yeah, making me leave all my friends. Exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. <laughs> you know what? He or she will very much thank you in about 10 years. Yeah. Well, on that note, he I just got him a Raspberry Pi. Oh. And, um, I'm, I'm trying to load up, I think, Pop! OS. Uh, we were going to try to load up on that thing to play Minecraft. He's a he's a big so, Minecraft guy. So and I have a wonderful book recommendation: <laughs> Learning to Program in Python Using Minecraft from No Starch mm -hmm. Press. Uh, Microsoft makes a special Raspberry Pi distribution that includes Minecraft. At least they used to. I think they still do. And it has a special API for programming, which means he can write little Python programs and build towns in one keystroke and things like that it's really fun uh uh but yeah you're this is great in fact that's how i started uh with a minecraft server i used to run a minecraft server off the raspberry pi and then of course you uh -huh. know then i needed a bigger computer and i needed more memory more and pretty soon yeah. <laughs> but it's a great place well, to start yeah i was able to get him the uh the raspberry pi 4 with the 64 bit um, nice I, I was able to this, so. I don't know how. Uh, that's amazing. Learn to program with Minecraft. No starch press. I don't know if he has any interest in programming, but if he ever wanted to get into programming, if you're already a Minecraft fan, this is the easiest way, and it's and it uses a Raspberry Pi. In fact, the book comes with the software and, and all of that stuff. So, 
Pretty cool. Okay. Pretty I'm, cool. Get them programming. So, so really, but what people don't, kids don't know is Minecraft is programming. It, it, mm-hmm. You're really learning about kind of how blocks go together and cause and effect. And it, it's very much a kind of preschool for programmers. So teach them a good skill. Yeah. Because you know what? Flipping hamburgers is not a living wage. <laughs> Have a great time in jolly old England. Thanks, Jay. Leah Laporte, the tech guy. I'm amazed you were able to get a uh, raspberry pie. Yeah. Where did you get it? Um, uh, Canna, can I think. Was it Canna Kit? Oh, Canna Kit. Yeah, they're good. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, because that's been a huge supply chain problem. I had I had to get the um the the uh, extreme kit is that eight gigs yeah um, that makes sense they're just going to prioritize people who are going to buy a little more that's good yeah and it's got the aluminum enclosure which is you know good for a thirteen year old not to get it all dusty and whatnot so um, that's so great we're pretty and we're we, we're got it hooked up to monitor and trying to get it programmed right now nice so, um so the 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 no starch press kit is that where can i get that uh online amazon i put a link in the show notes no starch.com slash programming with minecraft but that has all the information to run minecraft in this special windows distribution okay all right and can i well i i, I use a mac so i can download all that stuff and then put it on a well, that's on the Raspberry oh, Pi. Yeah, you put it on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. 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 Raspberry Pi comes with a Raspbian, which is a Linux. It's a Debian Linux. So he's already mm-hmm. using Linux mm-hmm. with the with the uh, default operating system for that. Right. We, and we tried to download Microsoft Minecraft for Raspberry Pi, but it or, or for Linux, but we kept getting a, an error message with it. So Yeah, that's the um, Java version. But uh, I would look at this. I hope it's not out of date. It is, you know, it's seven years old, and I don't know if. I wonder if my. Let me see here, uh, if they still are offering the. Uh, if Microsoft is because they used to have a special distribution just for Raspberry Pi, not only with Minecraft but also with a plug-in that allows you to program it, which is what's really cool about this. Is he at all mm-hmm. interested in that kind of thing? Uh, he does know a little bit. He took computers uh, oh, his good. first semester in school. Perfect. So he does a little bit of the programming language, but he loves playing on the servers like uh, murder mysteries and. Oh, nice! Um, oh, that's he great. Loves doing all that. He's very good. But um, so, but he he's very interested in programming, and so hopefully this will get him primed and uh, you know kickstart over there. Yeah, they still offer the Minecraft Pi edition. Microsoft does. It's called the Minecraft right. Pi edition. Uh, I will. Uh, I have a ar- brand race and articles from September. Uh, I will put also in the show notes from the Raspberry Pi Foundation about how to how to run that. Um, so that's yes. This is this is a little different than what you were doing. You're just trying to put a, a client so he could play Minecraft. But this this is like a whole nother level. He'll be running a server that he can then play from another computer on his. Raspberry Pi server. He can program it. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do with it. It's really cool. Okay. Yeah. It's really cool. All right. He's that's Very a cool. that's a really great gift for a 13 year old, if you ask me. No, I'm not going to yeah, give you a, a PC. I'm going to give you a Raspberry Pi. You figure it out. Yeah. Really. It, it's been you know, he's been kind of like shy to get into it, but I think uh, with this, you know, maybe just intimidated by it. But um, I think with some. Well, that's the beauty of this. And, you know, he's probably going to have a lot of alone time when you first move. (laughs) I hate to say it. Uh, This is the opportunity to jump on that where he's kind of getting just getting his feet. He doesn't yet have a lot of buddies that he can hang out with and stuff. Um, Right. Yeah. I think that's a great opportunity. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're going to have so much fun. I'm very jealous. What a fun thing to do with the kids. I'll I'll have a pint in your honor, Leo. Please do. (laughs) That's awesome. Thanks, Jay. Yes, sir. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, 
All that jazz, the new Pixel phone, if you want to talk about it, or the Pixel Watch, 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number, 888-827-5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you could still call, but you've got to use Skype out or something like that. 8888-ASK-LEO, uh, that's the phone number. Love to hear from you if you want to talk high tech. Uh, Pixel Watch announced by Google. Uh, this week, I, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I had assumed that Google had made a watch before. They haven't. They made a watch operating system called Wear OS. And a lot of other companies like Motorola and Fossil and others make watches with the Google operating system. But Google never made a watch. So it's a big deal, this new Pixel watch. They also announced the successor to the uh, Pixel 6 phone, the Pixel 7 which really pretty much is, you know, at this point, we don't expect a whole lot from the next generation phone, right? I mean, there's a little thing here and there. They got a aluminum camera bump instead of a plastic camera bump, that kind of thing. Uh, it's pretty minor, although I still think that probably it's probably the case that the Pixel phones of all the phones may have the best cameras I mean, it's all very close between Samsung's high-end phones, Apple's iPhones, and the Google phones. They're, they're all pretty close, but it's it, it, a matter of uh, millimeters difference. But I would say the Pixel phone has come out on top. One of the places they've lagged behind a little bit is in video. Now uh, they have uh, the new phones will have all the same kind of video features that Apple has put into its iPhone. They should be just as good if, you know, who knows, maybe even better for video. Uh, that's a minor difference. You know what? It really comes down to more, uh, well, whose ecosystem you want to live in. And that's what I really it became obvious at this Google event uh, on Thursday this week. It's the ecosystem play. And Apple, of course, led the, led the bunch by doing this. They make a phone. They make headphones. They make a watch. They make a tablet. They make a computer. And everything works better if you buy them all. Just if you live in the Apple world, you know, with Apple's messages, you know, oh, don't use those, oh, those Android messages, don't you know, Apple messages, Apple everything, right? It just works better. Samsung has been doing the same thing with their Samsung phones. Uh, they do make computers, but they're not with a Samsung operating system. They're with Windows, but they do work very well with Windows. There's a Your Phone app that runs on Windows that works pretty much exclusively with Samsung phones. It's supposed to work with all Android phones, but it really works a lot better with Samsung phones. They do have an operating system they call Dex, but it's kind of a like a phone operating system that you could put on a big screen. Uh, and, of course, they have a watch, and they have earbuds. So Samsung's got it, Google's got it, Apple's got it. And so now the choice is, well, whose world do you want to live in? And I think Google's got a big problem. You know, since 2015, they've only sold 27 million phones. Now, that seems like 27 million. I'd take it. But, I mean, Apple sells more than that in a quarter. They uh, Samsung sells more than that in a quarter. So it's, it's a fraction. They're a distant third in the phone race. And that by itself makes it kind of harder to recommend a Google ecosystem. I mean, they do have some other things. For instance, they showed that if you get a Google tablet, you'll be able to mount it on a base and it'll turn it into what they already, something similar to what they already sell, the Google Assistant photo frame they call the Nest Hub Max, which I like. You know, it's a screen. It's got good speakers. You could talk to it. Your little plastic pal that you could put in the kitchen or the living room or the bedroom. You can make calls on it, that kind of thing. And so this, you know, they're they're expanding the eco. We call it an ecosystem play. And, of course, it's good for the companies if you only buy their products. Not so good for consumers, I hate to say. Uh, I think it would be better if uh, it was a more competitive environment. But really, they figured out. Sometimes the uh, business folks use the term silo. Or everything's in a silo. They figured out it's better to be to have a run a silo than it is to run something that's compatible with other things. That's not as good.
And Apple, you know, for a long time had to be compatible with Windows and other things. But now they're so dominant, they don't have to anymore. So it's better. More money that way. In fact, it, what they really focus on these days, all three of them, Samsung, Google, and Apple, is not how many phones they sell, but ARPU. It's big, they're big on ARPU. Average revenue per user. See, you can only, you're only going to buy a new phone every few years, right? They only get, but if, if you buy the Google One plan or the Apple Plus plan, or I actually it's the Apple One plan as well, isn't it? I can't remember. Or the Samsung, I don't know, does Samsung have something similar? And you get the music and you get the video and you get them, everything, and then, then they get your $15 a month every month. That's ARPU, baby, and that's what the market, Wall Street wants them to do. Market rewards, high revenue per user. Uh, so that's what they're doing. And, of course, it's the only way they can grow because, they, you know, they've pretty much saturated the market with phones. Everybody's got one. And for the most part, when you enter the ecosystem, it's very sticky, right? That sounds gross. I don't mean it that way. It's, it's sticky because you can't, you know... All your friends are in it. You're in it. You're, everything works together. Once you buy into Apple, Google, or Samsung, you're pretty much going to stay there. It's like laundry detergent. You know, once you become a Tide user, it's very unlikely you're going to use Cheer. They know that. They want to get you early, get you young, and, you know, if you're a Coca-Cola drinker, you ain't going to be drinking Pepsi. If you're a Samsung user, sorry, Google. I think of all of the three, Apple's got the really the strongest play. But Google's got some interesting stuff that Apple doesn't do, like those assistants with a screen on them. They have doorbells now. They have cameras. They have a lot of home automation stuff Apple doesn't have. And Apple's home automation initiative, HomeKit, has been struggling a little bit. So uh, it's not a, it's, it is a winner-take-all race, believe me, in the long run. I mean, all three can coexist, but but one of them's going to get big fast, and I think Apple's got the inside track. But Google's trying, to their credit. Now they've got to watch. They're doing their best. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Back to the phones we go. Eric's on the line from Los Angeles. Hi, Eric. Hey, Leo. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Thanks uh, for calling. <laughs> this is a crazy Facebook question. Um, in August, in the middle of the night, while I was sleeping... My Facebook account gets hacked. Mm. Lovely. And I <laughs> I wake up and I get all these messages saying, uh, you know, some, you know no, some unusual activity, blah, blah, blah. And I said, of course, it's not me. And long story short, I retake my account. Oh, good. Congratulations. Okay. But thank you on that. But the perp had violated terms and conditions by posting something, <clears throat> excuse me, posting something really bad. Oh, no. And they're blaming so, you? <laughs> they disabled my account. Ay, 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 ay. And, <laughs> and of course, I requested a review instantly. And for a month, when I logged in, it just said review requested. Your account's disabled, the review is requested. But now it says, remember, this was back in August. Now it says, too much time has elapsed since your account has been disabled, and a review cannot be requested. Catch 22! <laughs> it took so much I mean, time because like, you didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. And so it's it's crazy. It's like, of course, I've tried all the hack email addresses I've found through YouTube or whatever. And, and Let me tell you, this awesome. is a real problem. In fact, yesterday, news came out that Facebook is warning a million users they might have been hacked because there have been apps now on iOS and Android, 400 of them, that... Are, exist for one purpose only, to steal your Facebook login. Maybe this is how you got yours stolen. It looks like a photo editor or, you know, mobile game or something like that. You you download it, and it says, oh, good, sign in with Facebook, you know, as many things do, right? Except it's not a real mm -hmm. sign in with Facebook. It's give us your Facebook login credentials so we can sign in for you. And a million people have downloaded these apps now. And so you're in a line. You're a long line, buddy. <laughs> you're in a, you know, I, there isn't any answer. You don't, there's no recourse. There's no Supreme Court for Facebook. You know, they yeah. either, there's nothing you can do. You're out of luck. Just, just, it seems that way. They're a private company that can do whatever they want. You know? That's right. And they have three and a half billion users. They really don't care. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but Facebook stock is tanking. 
Facebook itself is facing some serious existential issues. It may not be around much longer. I know that sounds amazing to say. How could that be? These guys are completely dominant. Well, they're they're suffering. And this is just one more nail in the coffin. And I feel for you. We get calls all the time for people whose accounts have been hacked. That's why I was so pleased that you got it back. Because that's rare. <laughs> but then, oh, maybe it wasn't such a good thing. Um <laughs> You know, you know, I can't fix this for you. You know that, and I, and I'm just sharing your pain. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah. You've done I didn't everything. Know if it you was some do. sort of other no. hack or, or anything. No, there's know. no Supreme you know, Court. I'm not, there's no higher authority. You can't appeal to. You know, it's a, you know I I've had this for 14 years, and I, I don't consider myself like a Facebook social butterfly. But yeah. after all this time, you realize there's how much stuff part of your life is all the yeah. connections you have with people, and uh, it's tragic. Uh, you know, the, I know. You know, it's. Well, I think we've all learned something here, haven't we? I don't know what it is we've learned, but I think we've learned something. I hope we've learned something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's not that I don't have any sympathy. I completely sympathize, but I just don't have an answer. And this is universal. This is, And there's one million more people who just got emails from Facebook saying, oh, hey, by the way, your account might have been hacked. You're in a very popular group. Um yeah, I don't know what you can do. I mean, keep trying. Don't give up. Don't be deterred by that announcement. You just explain to them, well, look, you didn't... I'm trying to get this back for three months. You didn't respond. It's not my fault. Keep keep at it. Maybe, you know, you, you got through once. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, back in August. Uh, yeah. and, I'm so uh, sorry. You know, I just, I, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. And it's just a lesson uh, for all of us. Don't, you know, if, you, if you're putting stuff in Facebook, make copies. Uh, save it, you know, save your not friend graph and all that stuff. You know, yeah, if you're not on Facebook, you won't be able to reach those people who are on Facebook. I just, you know, I miss stuff because I'm not on Facebook. I was just uh, told there was a big reunion of the radio station in San Francisco I worked at that just went out of business. And, uh, and I missed it because where did they announce it? On Facebook. So... You know. <laughs> And probably everyone there was probably at least 50 years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm older than them, but I still am not on Facebook. I can tell you right now. And you're right. The youngers, the younger people, they're not on Facebook anymore. Actually, my kids are on Facebook because they see the value of it. It really is how you communicate. My, my daughter's an aspiring stand-up comic. Where do you pr promote your appearances? Facebook. That's where you do it. Uh, so it's a huge value. I don't know. I don't know what we can do about this. I, it's uh, there is a bill in Congress. I doubt it'll make any difference. Call about interoperability. The idea that your data should be portable and movable to another site. There should be, you know, a new Facebook, Facebook two that should uh, be run better, and you could move all your stuff to. There isn't, but and I don't think a law will change that. But that's the motivation behind the law. And I think that that is a reasonable motivation. It's a real problem. These are, I was talking about silos. These are silos. They're, you're locked in. And if you should, you know, and this is true. Google, Facebook, every account you have, at their whim, they can kill you. And there's no recourse. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, that's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's not like this is, uh, you know, you can contact an attorney or something. No. A private company can do yeah. whatever they that's want. That's right. You know? There's, so, there's uh, literally zero recourse. I All I can do is commiserate. I'm sorry, Eric. That's That stinks. <laughs> that stinks, man. 8888, ask Leo. I'm sorry, guy. Uh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt, photo guy coming up. More of your calls, too. I, you know, I, I wish there were some, I wish there were a magic bell I could ring, but there isn't. Sorry for sure that Chris is here. I see a smiling face right now. Oh, yay. That's how sure I am. Hi, Chris. Hi there. How's welcome, it going? Welcome back. We missed you, my friend. Yeah. So sorry for the short short notice. Oh no 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 no, no 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 Everything everything I, happens at always, the same time. Always all always the time. always okay. It's fine. No, you do yes. us a service by sh by being here. Uh, I it would be churlish of me to complain if you know well, you have something I wanna else to do. Well, I want to be dependable though. Eh, I'm not dependable. Why should yeah. you be? <laughs> 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 Thanks for making me feel better. Oh yeah, no, glad no, to be quite, back. It's quite fine, and we, but yeah, we miss you. I'm not saying we don't miss you. We do, but uh, 
That's always okay for you to take time off. Uh, we'll talk in 10. Will do. Do I have an email or anything I need to do? Uh, you have an email, but you don't need to do anything. That's the kind of email I like. Thank you, yeah. sir. Assignment review. Assignment, Assignment review, review coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Not a drag, I hope. 88. It is a drag, though, when Facebook account. <laughs> Facebook might be a drag. When Facebook closes your account for activity you didn't do because somebody hacked your account. Holy cow. What a mess. Uh, what, do, what, do, what do people do? I guess, uh, you know, what's my advice? Uh, I Look, I'm not going to say don't use Facebook. I don't. Um, for, you know, I just, I, I abandoned Facebook. I thought Facebook was great. Really did. I mean, at least in principle, the idea that you can connect with family and friends, stay in touch, share photos, share your life. That's great. That's a brilliant idea. It's not what Facebook is anymore. Thanks to the news feed, um, you don't see everything Aunt Matilda posts. You see a bunch of other stuff that you didn't necessarily want to see because the algorithm knows that you're not going to stay online as long if it's just, you know, cousin Fred and Aunt Matilda, you're going to, you're going to move on. You're going to read their posts and go somewhere else. So what are we going to do? We're going to feed you extreme content that you will, you know, you go, I, what? I'm, I'm outraged. I'm mad. And so the whole, you know, I, I would get upset when I would read Facebook. I would get upset. So I just said, you know, this isn't good. And I just abandoned my account and the pictures I'd posted there over the years and the friends and the connections because it's not what Facebook uh, was supposed to be, and it's not what I wanted it to be. Facebook does allow you to back up your stuff, download your stuff, but it, I know that's weak sauce because there's nothing like else like Facebook you can be on. A lot of families are starting to do, and I think this is interesting as a solution, they're starting to create their own private groups on Sites like Discord, that's free. Discord is a, well, it was originally started as a way for gamers to chat together, but really it's a great, we have a Discord uh, group for our uh, club members. We have a little uh, club for seven bucks a month for our podcast listeners, and they go into the Discord and they can chat with each other. They they can talk. It's great. Uh, and you could do that with your family. Uh, one of our uh, podcast hosts, Sam Pruitt, uh, he has family. He's fr he's from uh, South Carolina. His family in North Carolina has moved out here to California. He has his family has a Slack group. It's another messaging app, mostly used in business. But it turns out, you know, the free version of Slack gives you all the features you'd want. And it's like a mini Facebook, but it's just your family, just invited family and friends. I think that might be. You know, we we can't really we don't know we can't really measure how common that is. But I think more and more. That gives you what you originally joined Facebook for. The problem is there's no discoverability. You have to, somebody has to be invited in to participate in that kind of thing. Uh, Lyhurst in our uh, chat room says we have a family Zoom meeting every weekend. Yeah, we, we've done that for sure. That would be another thing you might want to do in something like Discord where Discord has video. You could have group meetings periodically and stuff. I just feel like there are better platforms, but they're not universal, you know. I don't know what the answer is. Social offers so much, but it also hurts. Chris Markberg. Come. Am I mellow? Do I seem mellow to you? Well, wait till I drink this Chris in Miami cup of coffee, and uh, maybe I won't seem so mellow. I'm pretty mellow. Ah, I'm a mellow fellow. Early on in my uh, career, they said, you have a voice for FM, you can't do AM radio. Do you think I have a, Laura, I have a voice for FM, I shouldn't be on the uh, AM band. <laughs> well, but I'm on AM radio, so that's, I should be talking like this. I should be talking like Bill Handel. Very excited. But I do, I said, they said more like, uh, that's Leonard Skinner, and uh, coming up just around the corner, what a shade of pale. We're going to take a 24-hour non-stop music block right here on... Yeah, love KCRW, the great public radio station down there, yeah. 
Yeah, that was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in B major. Opus six. <laughs> We're really dancing to Steve Aoki tonight. So sit back, smoke a doobie, and rock out. Not a doobie? We don't say that anymore. That's from my era. Smoke a blunt and relax. Grab a bull. Let's have some Red Bull, baby. A bowl. Oh, yes. Pass the duchy on the left-hand side. Please. Oh, before we go, our show today brought to you quite literally by Cashfly. Cashfly is our CDN, our content delivery network. And it's amazing. How do I know? Because for 10 years, if it weren't for Cashfly, there would be no twit. No tech guy. Deliver now. You can do video with Cashfly. This is really cool. They call it their ultra low latency video streaming. Deliver your video with Cashfly. You get the best throughput, the best global reach. Your content is practically infinitely scalable, and you can go live almost immediately within hours instead of days. And the latency, sub one second. That's as live as live could be. Ditch that unreliable web RTC solution for their WebSocket live video workflow can scale to millions of users. So easy to set up. You'll dramatically increase your sites and application speed for global audiences. It's one of the reasons we use Cashfly because when you download a show, you're downloading it from a server that's near you. They have 50 points of presence all over the globe. So you get that show from somewhere nearby. That means faster, better performance. And because they're multiple they use multiple uh, sources. Very, very reliable. In fact, over the last uh, 12 months, Cashfly has had 100% availability. 100%. They're multi-CDN, so that gives you redundancy and failover. It intelligently balances your traffic across multiple providers. So you get the shortest routes and the zero performance glitches. It's been really fantastic for us. And partly that's also because of the Cashfly support, guys. So good. 24-7 support. Response times in less than an hour. You can reduce your uh, origin server bills, you know, if you're using S3 or whatever, by using Cashfly's storage optimization system. I know we use this. It reduces bandwidth because you store your content on Cashfly's servers. So your cache hit ratio is now 100%. No more misses. That's a huge benefit. And, of course... Cashfly has something for everybody besides ultra low latency video streaming, the storage optimization system for games. You get lightning fast gaming, faster downloads, zero lag, glitches or outages. If you got a website, you'll love their mobile content optimization. It automatically and simply gives you image optimization, which means your site will load faster on any device. Ten times faster than traditional methods. On six continents, Cashfly is 30% faster than other major CDNs with a 98% cash hit ratio. And as I said, 100% availability over the past year. Cashfly, take advantage of their 24-7, 365 priority support. They're always there when you need them. They've been so great for us. I just want to share it with you too. Find out more at cashfly.com. As I say, every show, bandwidth for the tech guy is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com. Thank you, Cashfly. Now back to the program. It's time to talk photography with everybody's favorite photographer, Chris Marquart, my personal photo sensei at sensei.photo, a great professional photographer who's written so many books and workshops and just does a great job kind of communicating about photography. He joins us every week to do this. Moin moin, Chris. It's great to see you again. Moin moin. It's so good to be back. How are you doing? I am great. What what's what what is the topic of the day today? Well, the topic of the day is the assignment that uh, was started. Evil. We're going to do evil. Remember the oh, e no. the evil assignment. Here we go. Um and uh we have um well, I've taken four four actually today instead of just three out of 
the 35 that were submitted uh, depicting Ooh, these are Bill scary. And this is perfect. You did this randomly from the fishbowl, and yet it's perfect for for spooky month. October is spooky month. Well, not not too many uh, Halloween uh, references in here, but um, let's let's get started with one that. Well, okay, so T T L Volkman. Um, submitted a picture titled A Bold Ending. And initially I thought, what is evil about this? But then the, okay, so what we're, what we're seeing here is a very interesting light phenomenon that um, happens when the sun sets and uh, there are clouds over you. And these are kind of darkish looming clouds, but then there's an opening that the sun can can hit the clouds from below. So what we're seeing is clouds that are that are, skimmed by warm red sunlight from below so it looks almost like a well it's like a kind of a hellish uh, scenario i think it looks um, like so a peaceful easy easy evening but okay i'll well, take it i'll take well, it yeah i i kind of i like the color scheme and and the light phenomenon i'm i'm a, i'm totally in love with what the sun can do to clouds yeah, if it comes beautiful. from the direction that you don't expect it to come from yeah, so it's really quite beautiful. um yeah if, if anything, it's a beautiful picture. Um, second one is by Doug Burba. And... Never more, <laughs> quoth the raven. Wow. This is a, a crow sitting on a headstone in a cemetery. Yikes. And for some reason, crows crows are, are associated with the dark and the evil. And uh, there's, well, and then we have a, a cemetery and... Um, the, the 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 things I like about this, apart from it having that e evil vibe, is that it is backlit. So what you see in this photo is the light just skimming the side of the crow a bit and the and the headstones, but um, the side that you're looking at is in the dark, and that gives it that silhouette look and that stylized look, and uh, it's a really good fit. It's a very good fit for the It's subject, evil. So this is good. Well done. Yeah. That's really good. It's it. totally evil. Yeah. Nailed it. Uh, the Nailed the it. last one took me Yeah, the, the 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 third one took me a second um by Alex Zarnowski uh titled Just Like Clockwork and what we're seeing is a scene looks like New York uh, City and there's an there's a an ad on a wall by Gucci and they pick a character from Clockwork Orange. If you've seen that movie, there's something se severely oh, yeah. evil about yeah. that movie. Yeah, they're all his droogs are sitting in the milk bar, ready, getting ready for an so, evening of ultra violence. Are they wearing Gucci exactly. clothes? Is that what makes this a Gucci? Well, I think I think that's what's happening. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure, but there, there's uh, certainly a character that looks like Alex from that movie and another character that I don't think has anything to do with oh, that movie. Oh, the guy on the right but, isn't from the movie. He's wearing Gucci. No. How interesting. So, interesting... But they are both holding a glass of milk and the, the right hat and the right like makeup and so there yeah there's that's there's something evil about this the would this ad have, or uh, using that as an ad would, I, would this have been better if he'd zoomed come in a little more or walked a little closer i don't because you can't really see the well, center of attention well yes and no i mean it is it is very much in the middle and it of course also sets the whole uh, the scene by including context. I, I typically like photos with context, and in that, in our context of evil, it, it does make sense to have this um, to have this a bit a wider shot because yeah, yeah, because you want to see the street scene and all that. It's a street photography. I I've chosen one bonus photo by Rex Bowlby, um, which. Uh, he he gets extra points, extra bonus points for effort because um, what Rex did is he has um, he set up uh, <laughs> four four screens in front of his himself. It's very funny. Quotes with headlines with with subjects from spam mails and one screen saying spam is evil. And it has the usual, I'm a Nigerian prince with a special request and the buy Viagra, five cents a pill. Those and ransomware. Are evil. And, uh, I agree with him 100%. And, 
I must, and then he put himself in the photo. So this is like there. He put some real effort into this, and uh, that gets uh, that gets a bonus point for sure. So spam is evil. I think we can all agree. So, so uh, we have uh, from Scooter go. X, uh, one of our chat mods in our Discord, uh, the explanation of that Gucci ad. Uh, Gucci has been doing shots from scary movies in their oh. ad campaign, including one from The Shining. Uh, a st actually, it's all Stanley Kubrick. That's what it is. That's what's in common. Ah, two thousand one, okay. A Space Odyssey, Clockwork Orange, and Eyes Wide Shut. All Stan Stanley Kubrick movies with uh, Fashion Week twenty twenty two outfits added. I see. That just gets now. It eye. makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I don't it makes know. A lot more sense. I don't know if it's. Uh, if it makes well, if it makes sense to you, I guess it, it's fashion. What are you going to say? High fashion is a little strange. Well, fashion doesn't it only makes limited sense to me. But I know Stanley Kubrick and his movies. So I love Stanley that, Kubrick movies. That's where that's where it comes together. Yeah. yeah. So this assignment thing we do uh, on a monthly basis. Chris comes up with uh, a topic. He's got his big fishbowl there, ready to pull an adjective out of the fishbowl and. It's just an incentive to get you out there taking pictures. doesn't matter if you do it with a fancy camera or a camera phone, but you want to illustrate a word or concept. What Pick pick the word out there, mister. I think Are the evil official. was really interesting that that's, has that's the one you came spoken. up with for Halloween. Oh, this one. This one's a good one. Oh, this one's a good one. Yes, we yes. have mysterious. Ooh, even, even another Halloween. That's a nice fit for this month. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Mysterious. So how does there this you work? Go. Well... You go out and take pictures. That's really how it works, the whole point of the uh, exercise. Uh, when you find one that really says mysterious to you, you know, really expresses that, uh, upload it to Flickr.com. It's a free photo sharing site we use and love. Uh, we're both pro members, but you don't have to be to participate. And then submit it to the Tech Guy group. Make sure you tag it TG Mysterious. TG for Tech Guy and Mysterious for the subject. That way... Our moderator, Marina Silverman, will know that you mean this for our uh, our assignment. And one month hence, we'll give you about four weeks, right around November, early November. Chris will uh, pick a few to talk about on the radio, so you'll get a little notoriety, but that's all. That's your only reward. Your reward <laughs> is going out and taking pictures, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. How come... Now, I don't participate often. Occasionally, I'll upload a picture because I don't want to, you know, I know I have an in with the judge. But, uh, and you don't participate just, I mean, do you think like behind the scenes, I'm going to take some mysterious pictures? I do that. I'm going to take some pictures. I, I yeah, of submit. course. Of yeah, course. It, it yeah. sets it sets a mood. It sets it sets the it sets the feeling of going into photography and it makes it a bit more of a deliberate thing to take pictures. I love mysterious because that could be a lot of things. And I love the idea of creating a composition with some mystery in it. That's going to be interesting. All right, get out there. It doesn't matter if it's your Pixel or your iPhone or your Samsung or your DSLR, your fancy Canon and Nikon or your Fuji or your OM-1, whatever it is, go out, take a picture or two, submit them, and we'll talk about it in a month. And Chris will be back next week to talk photography. Thank you, Chris. Sensei.photo for much. all his good stuff. mysterious last night would have been a good time to take a mysterious picture of the full moon <laughs> all right sir all right thank you so very and uh, we'll see you uh, next week unless you know you want to go visit the folks there. or whatever you know no. go I'll, 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 I've, had, I've, had, I've had my vacation unless I've you're in the mood to visit Svalbard you can know, go ahead when are yeah, you doing? No. I'm telling you, the one I really want to do is Bhutan. That is still in somewhere in the in in the discussion, but it's complicated, I do not I'm have sure. a date. Yeah, it's it is. It is very complicated yeah, right yeah. now. Well, just very just count on me when you're going to Bhutan. Lisa and I'll join you. Well, I'll be I'll be doing the Eastern European photo road trip next year. Yeah, that might be fun. So that might be fun. That is that is going to be fun. Small, Eastern small Europe, group, a, little, a little risky right now, but okay, it might be fun. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, it, you, you could, you could. It doesn't matter if you're a few hundred miles closer or <laughs> right. further away. It yeah, you're make used to it. Yeah, you're honest. used to it. You figure, you know, 
Is there in Germany, do the people are, are they aware of, you know, the madman and the war and the of risks? And, <laughs> are you kidding? Of yeah, course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course yeah. there's a lot of discussion around that. There's a lot of uh, discussion around supporting Ukraine with like uh, weapon deliveries and that kind of right. stuff. There's right. like it's all it's all over the news, unfortunately. Yeah. <sighs> all right, Chris, stay safe. It is what it is right now. Yep. Build that uh, bomb shelter, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. We'll do. <laughs> See you then. See you. Bye bye. Bye now. <laughs> oh, you're good. Oh, you're very good. Leo Laporte, the toke guy, a tech guy, 8888, ask Leo the phone number. If you want to talk high tech, I'm here for you. Uh, we're going to talk space with Rod Pyle in about an hour. Lots to talk about there. Al's on the line from Vista, California. Hi, Al. Hi, Leo. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more about what you said about Facebook. I think... Uh they're kind of get, getting caught in, in, or the leader is, uh, this metaverse thing. That they are. They've abandoned. Uh, but, you know, I think it's interesting. Did Who abandoned whom? It may be. Well, I think Mark Zuckerberg sees this as their future. Yeah, but to, to get to like a holograph or holodeck Star Trek type metaverse, could, it probably will never arrive. What I've seen of it, it's like cartoonish figures. I agree. And, you know, it's ridiculous. A way it, time waster, it, and uh, they should stick to their fixing their main platform. And I couldn't agree you know, more. Think? Yeah, I think now, Mark question, Mark is all uh, in love with the metaverse because of science fiction, et cetera. But I think you're right. They're spending ten billion a year. They have more yeah. than ten thousand employees working on it. <laughs> the the funny the funny story this week uh, is that their their metaverse horizon worlds is so bad that even Facebook's employees are barely, barely using it. I heard that. <laughs> well, I agree with your, your negative opinion, but yeah. the other question is on the Twitter Elon Musk deal. Mm. Uh, I, he overpaid. Don't you? I mean, I don't, oh, that's why he's trying to get out of it. He, cause it, it, 44 billion, well, $54 yeah. and 20 cents a share is so much more than Twitter's worth. Uh, yeah, that he, 30. I think he had yeah. cold feet almost instantly and has been trying to get out of it. The question is why he changed his mind this week and said, all right, I'll buy, all right, all right, I'll buy it. Uh, either he's trying to delay it, which he did. He successfully delayed the trial. So. Yeah. Or he uh, feels like he's going to lose anyway. I think the, my, my suspicion is it's getting embarrassing for him because in the process of discovery, as you know, before a trial, both sides get to get documents from the opposing side and in the process of discovery we've seen all these direct messages to elon that are highly embarrassing yeah. and uh, he was about to do a deposition on thursday i think he didn't want to do that and i think the real smoking gun is that it's thought there might have been messages between him and the twitter whistleblower peter zotko <laughs> before he whistle blew like maybe elon incited him to do it which would be criminal now, now you're really getting in trouble. So maybe yeah. all of those combined, and he said, fine, 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 I'll pay. The, the question is, will the banks, his lenders, agree? They're going to lose their shirts on this deal. Or Larry Ellison. Ellison Two himself, billion you know. dollars Ellison put yeah. in. And what that's, if he pulls out? Will Musk go ahead? I, I don't know. You know. So Well, he could be uh, compelled to, in which case he's got to sell a lot of Tesla, Tesla. stock. Yeah. So Tesla could fall also. I mean, that's right. Tesla. That's yeah. right. It's a, well, you know what? I people are bored with it or hate it, and I understand because it's just so crazy. But it is quite a fascinating soap opera. <laughs> I mean, it sure is. It's very interesting. Okay, thank you, Leo. Oh, that's it. Okay, thank you, Al. I appreciate yeah, well, it. I have a little more. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You got it. Something else. Okay, go ahead. Yes. So, so I guess you'd say uh, don't uh, don't buy Tesla or or Facebook at the, I, or um, Twitter at the. Well, I don't. Meeting. You know, you sh you'd be crazy to listen to me for stock advice. I'll say that right up front, and I certainly aren't. Well, I'm never going to give you stock advice. No. Uh, well, I don't invest in tech stocks, you know, mostly for editorial credibility. I don't want you to think that I'm making money or losing money based on my no. Well, reviews. let me ask you about Twitter itself. What do you think about – Do you, I'm bothered by the Twitter uh, policing and hacking and bots as much – uh, does that bother you? I mean, are you are do you have a Twitter account or have yeah, you? Yeah, no, I've been. I was one of the. I was a very early user of Twitter. Yeah, me too. Uh, and in okay. fact, in 2006, I was the number one most followed person on Twitter, 
with a whopping 5,000 followers at the time. Yeah. That put me number one. And then this guy named Ashton Kutcher came along and and uh, took over the role. And then a guy <laughs> named Barack Obama really clobbered me. And so I, uh, I, only, I have about half a million followers, which is a respectable number of followers. Who knows how many of those are real? That's not really uh, the issue. Um, I have some bots on Twitter that post links and things. Bots aren't necessarily spam. Uh, yeah. They could just be automated uh, tweets. Um, I, you know, I think with Twitter, the people I know who love Twitter, and most of them are people like me in the tech industry, tech journalism business, right. like it because it's a very fast, reliable signal of information, especially stories about tech. Uh, and you create your own Twitter by following who you follow, right? So you don't have to see something you don't want to see uh, uh -huh. if you follow somebody that's interesting. But at the same time, Twitter has been a platform for a lot of negative uh, things. And, uh, uh, you know, so because it is open and it's very easy to create an account, it's very difficult to control the content on Twitter. So there's all yeah, sorts of junk on there as well. Plus, they have difficulty in monetizing the content. I mean, you know, that, that's the problem. They, well, they here, been able to, you know. uh, as I said, I don't give stock advice, but I would tell right. you this. The reason there's some interest in Elon and what he might be doing with Twitter is because he may have a vision for where Twitter could go that exceeds what current management. Current management has sure. struggled for years to make any money on it, to grow it. It's just been failing. It's just been what it is for years. But he has this notion, which he's already tweeted about, of taking Twitter as the beginning, the backbone for what he calls the everything app. In China, they have an app called WeChat, which is right. used for everything from buying train tickets to getting the news. It's, it is, you live in WeChat, I'm, I hear, if you're in China. Can such an app exist in the U.S.? There's lots of reasons to think it might not. But remember, investors are looking for the next big thing. So if an investor, how is Uber getting money from investors? They've never made money. They've lost hundreds of millions of dollars every year because people think, well, it's possible that they have a glimmer of an idea about how the future is going to be. And we're going to take a chance. And a lot of these big investors, venture capitalists and stuff, know they're going to lose money on nine out of 10 investments. They're looking for one big hit. So they may, he may be able to raise money against this notion of turning Twitter into the everything app. If he succeeds, Billions. It's worth 10 times what it's selling for. If he right. fails, well, you really kind of know worse off than you are today, which well, is. Well, we'll see if the financing <laughs> comes through. That, that It's up and, you know. It, yeah. It, no, that's it. There's a lot of questions. I think that his he was getting the sense that the Delaware court was going to rule against him and force right. him to buy it. And so he said, I'd rather do this on my own terms and not have all this stuff exposed. And so he said, all right, all right, all right. But you well, know, I think what he's hoping is maybe Twitter will come back and say, OK, we'll sell for 40 or 30. No, no. Twitter said, you have a deal. We want 44 yeah. billion. And, yeah, and we'll Elon see. said, OK, I'll uh, I'll do the deal. And uh, so now we're just waiting to see, you know, they have there's still still some negotiation that has to happen. We're Final waiting. comment, this everything app that he's thinking about, um, you know, he'll have competitors, I'm sure. Uh, Facebook will try to get in on an everything app and some of the other, you know, he's not, it wouldn't be only him that would be trying that. There already have there, been there many attempts. Well, they have, yeah. yeah. That's what Facebook wanted to do with Messenger. That's why they added payments. Apple has definitely hinted that that's the kind of thing they'd right. like to do with messages. And Google probably too. It's, okay. Thank uh, you, Leo. You're welcome. It's a different world than China. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I don't think I need to tell you that. Uh, most people agree that the market conditions that made WeChat so successful in China do not exist in the United States. And the notion of creating an everything app, you know, and the thing is we don't, what we don't really ever know is what's going on in his head, right? We know it's kind of <laughs> a tossed salad in there, but we don't, we don't really know. Is he playing 12 dimensional chess or is he just, you know, losing his marbles? It's unclear. And, I'll give you a scenario. It's possible he knows perfectly well that Twitter is a money loser, that the only way he's going to be able to get the money, short of him selling stock, which he really doesn't want to do, is to convince people, whether he believes it or not, that he can turn it into a moneymaker. He's been saying this all along. I know how to make Twitter uh, financially successful. And yeah, he has a track record, right? 
So he may in his heart of hearts say, yeah, this is ridiculous. But if he can convince, this is how it works, enough people to give him money, hey, he's golden. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. I am uh, your tech guy for the remaining hour of this program. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number if you want to talk about tech. But, and we cover the waterfront, everything from what the heck is Elon Musk thinking <laughs> to what's good about the new Google Watch uh, to how do, I, how do I get my printer working again? Or why did Facebook cancel my account? All of that. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Uh, things we talk about, links and so forth, appear at the website. The show notes are at techguylabs.com. That's free. There's no sign-up. There's no login. It's just you go wander in. Uh, you'll see uh, all the shows there. This is episode 1934. By the end of the day today, we should have links to all the things I've mentioned. But we, in a couple of days, should have uh, audio from the show and video from the show. So if you miss a show, you can see it there. We'll also have a transcript of the show. So if you said, well, I knew he talked about this. How do, you know, where do I find that? Search the transcript. It has time codes. It should be very easy for you to find that. All of that is available at techguylabs.com. While you're there, if you don't mind a little self-promotion, you'll be on our uh, podcast site, twit.tv, This Week in Tech.tv. And there are a lot of other shows if for the geek inclined or the geek curious. You know, that's okay, too. Uh, about Mac, Windows, security, all the tech news, all of that. Um, it's all there. So techguylabs.com. Uh, Come on in. Hang out for a while. Browse around. Be, uh, we'll be talking, we have been talking in the chat room uh, about uh, Apple. Uh, normally in October, they would usually have an event. You know, they did the iPhone event, the iPhone Apple Watch event. But they have lots of other products, including Macintosh products and iPad products, and they didn't talk about last month. And usually they'd have an event. Uh, one of the big Apple rumor guys, Mark Gurman, says, not because of a source, but just his own noggin up there, I don't think they're going to do an event. Do they? It's not a big deal. I completely disagree with Mark. Uh, I think there will be an event because... Why not? Apple, <laughs> app, these Apple events get garner millions of views. They get so much attention. You get the press talking about you. You get people talking about you. It's a big ad, and it's basically free. All you have to do is make a video. Apple's got enough money to make the video. And I would submit they have enough products because they're, this is oh, you know almost certainly this month, unless they can't get these out for some reason because of supply chain or whatever, but almost certainly this month, they'll announce a new iPad Pro. They'll announce a new iPad. They'll announce new Macintosh computers, MacBook Pros 14 and 16 inches, uh, perhaps an iMac. They certainly will have a preview of the Mac Pro, the very, very highest end. They'll talk about their M2 chips. I know they released computers in the spring with M2 chips, but they will talk about the M2 Pro and the M2 Max. They haven't talked about those yet perhaps even an M2 Ultra. It's a chance for them to sell this whole area, whole line. There's other things, too, to talk about. The Apple TV, the HomePods. They may have announcements in those areas, too. So we've only, I think, scratched the surface of Apple's products with the iPhone and the Apple Watch and the AirPods. That was last month. This month, we should have an event. When? Well, let's see. Google had its event Thursday, October 6th, announced the Pixel 7 phone and the Pixel Watch. Uh... This Wednesday, the 12th, Microsoft's got to have an event uh, talking about their new Surface tablets and perhaps other products as well. There's rumors they will talk about a uh, Surface Studio 3. That's their desktop computer that I really like. Beautiful screen. So it won't be this week. And we would have heard by now if it was going to be this week. I think the best time to do this for Apple is a week from Tuesday, October 18th. If I'm right, You'll see, you know, the Apple, the tame Apple press announce, oh, we got our invitations. Probably this uh, this Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. Oh, we got our invitations. They also have to uh, release their new Mac OS Ventura. There's a lot to talk about. I, I have no concern in my mind that Apple will have an event. I think that's going to happen. So just a little heads up. The, the other reason it's good to mention is if you are in the market for an Apple product that is not an iPhone, Apple Watch, or AirPods, wait. Don't buy. This would be a bad time to buy a Mac or an iPad. 
wait and see what they announce for two reasons. One, they may announce something new that you want. And if they don't, reason number two, they'll probably drop the prices on the older stuff. In fact, we're already seeing some price drops, a $100 price drop, for instance, on the uh, headphones, the AirPods Max, AirPods Pro Max, I don't know what they call them. They ridiculously priced at $550. You can get them for $450 now. Usually that means we're close to maybe an update. That's usually what that means. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, let's go to Kelly on the line from Menifee, California. Hi, Kelly. Well, 7-3, Leo. How are you today? 7-3 to an amateur radio operator. How are you? I'm great. W6TWT on the line here. And W6KLY. Very nice to meet you. KLY. So that's KLY, yeah. For, Kelly. for Kelly. That's perfect. Obviously. I love that. Yeah. What's up, Kel? Okay, so I've got a grounding issue here in the house. Um, I, obviously, I'm a ham radio operator. Uh, you can see my setup at you know QRZ.com. Um, I'm also a 40 year studio musician has a pretty sizable home studio. Awesome. So I just moved into a new house, finally have the studio up and running. And the other day I went to record for the first time and this will lead obviously to the third part, which I think is going to be the issue. But the reason why I'm calling, um, the laptop that I'm working on uh, running my DAW, and I use Pro Tools-based software for my DAW. Um, as soon as I went to start to record, I just got this massive, massive cycle hum. Now, on my rack here, I use an EdTech HumX. Uh, I'm also using a line conditioner distro system for the power distribution system for all the rack here. Um, when I went to unplug the laptop from its power supply, it seemed to just disappear. Ooh. Even though I've got that running through an isolated EdTech hum that goes directly into the wall. So the hum only appears, the 60 hertz bzzz, only appears when the laptop's plugged in? Yes. And that's going to go to the second part of the, you know, running a ham radio station is obviously going to you know, blow this all apart. I have solar on the roof in this house. Now, okay. obviously, I didn't have that when I was living in the apartment um, that I used to have, but now I'm wondering if that is the cause of the problem. Hmm. But when you unplug the laptop, it goes away. It does. So it sounds like the laptop, or more likely the laptop power supply, is the source well, of the problem. Now, Isolating the laptop, I'm using an audio system ground loop isolator. It's a specific module that's designed to go in between the laptop yeah, that should take care and, of my, and my rack gear. But so it doesn't. Basically, I'm running three uh, <laughs> line conditioners and isolators, wow. and I just cannot track this down. It's so, driving me nuts. You, yeah, I mean, you know a lot more about this than I do, but... Uh, uh, and it sounds like you've done everything you can. One thing I would point out is if there's interference coming from the power supply on the laptop, it doesn't necessarily go into the plug, you know, where all, all that isolation is. It could be emanating from the wire. So make sure that that, that could be leaking into your system completely outside of the where it's plugged in, right? So right. make sure you don't have, you know, mic cables sitting next to or any kind of cabling sitting next to the power supply. I mean, kind of isolate that as best you can. Maybe even put yes. a choke. Maybe even put a choke on it. So you've isolated what's coming into the the receptacle, the plug socket. But that isn't necessarily the only source of the noise. Laptops too. Remember, you know, <laughs> hard to believe, but twenty years ago, when we first started getting gigahertz processors, people, the hams especially, were very concerned because they are now getting operating at close to the frequencies that we use in radio. And, and there was always concern that there'd be interference coming from not the not the power supply, but the, but the microprocessors in these things. So, uh, you know, I, I, yes, it could be from, of course, it could be from anything. And those, as you know, those solar panels, we have 60 on our house, and they come into a big inverter and a big box. And, of course, there, there could be a ton of interference coming out of that so right. I, I wouldn't rule that out sounds like you've done a lot of the the things but 
you know, it could, uh, it could, it could very well be just weird emanations from the the brick, the power brick, and that that aren't getting. Yeah, it's got to be something because uh, when I'm running the guitar gear, I've got you know massive amounts of stage pedals that I that I use with the guitar. Um, I don't get that from any of that. I don't get that from the electronic mesh v drums i don't get it from the bass rig i don't get it using vocals the keyboards it's just weird that it just seems to be the laptop now that buzz is coming across in the recording yeah how annoying Ugh. and especially when you you know when you're doing studio work everything is in headphones uh i you know i've got a 5000 watt home pa for wow. for doing final mix backs but inside of the headphones and um, the slightest amount of buzz or cycling um you know it rings through and it kicks up space you know when you're recording you're always looking for space in the speaker yeah, everything yeah. has its own you want it to be space. airy and open you exactly. don't want exactly and this thing is coming right dead center and i just how can't annoying knock it out oh, so annoying uh yeah i mean I'm not, I'm not an expert on this stuff. Uh, you know, if you have a, this is where a good electrician will be a useful thing. Um, I would, you know, the fact that every time you unplug the laptop, it goes away, you know what it yes. is. You know what it is. So uh, yeah. I would suggest, does the laptop on battery give you that uh, interference if it's not plugged into the wall? No, it, no, it does not. But obviously the, you know, running on battery is, you know, no, you don't want to do that. But I'm uh, running but, into the DAW with. No, I understand, but it isolates two hours. It isolates it. the noise. It's not coming from the laptop. It's coming from the power supply. That little. It's coming that, from the power that, supply. That brick. Yeah. So maybe even just try another one. Now that's one of the great things nowadays. Thanks to the EU, I was ripping on the EU for their cookie regulation. But I do. I am glad yeah. the EU has decided that everything should be charged by USB C. Used to be every laptop had its own proprietary charging. Now. They're all USB C. So get a new, you know, get a better USB C brick. In fact, I would look at some of the GAN, the gallium nitride uh, bricks coming from companies like Anchor that give you, you know, a lot of wattage for in a very small package. They may also, because they are gallium nitride, not off, not have the same kinds of problems. Uh, so you can get now get a Type C a charger that just try another one, and it's a good thing to have anyway. So uh, I, that's right. that's all I can. I, I'm the wrong guy to ask on this stuff. This RF, as you know, as a, every ham knows, RF is voodoo. It is. Yes, it it's is. It's voodoo. It's a it's a mystery science, and uh, and noise can come. I'm amazed actually that you own that you have such a nice clear sound. You've done everything you can except when you're plugging in this laptop. That sounds pretty good. That sounds yeah. pretty good. You're doing a great. You're doing a great job. What kind of music do you play? Well, uh, I do classic rock, country, worship music. Nice. Been playing nice. since 1980. Wow. Still I, plugging along. I will, I'll be playing in a wheelchair as they wheeling me off to the grave. You know, uh, we saw Motley Crue uh, the other day, and it was so great to see 71 years old. He's got ankylosis sp spondylitis. Uh, uh, their, uh, their lead guitarist, Nicky Mars, playing. Mm -hmm. He can barely move. But his fingers are as nimble as ever. He still lays down an amazing guitar riff. It was inspiring yeah. to see him. Uh, and that's exactly how you want to go, right? <laughs> Every, Absolutely. All the way to the bitter end. As long as your fingers can move, you're good. Uh, I'm not much help. Check the chat room. They have a lot of suggestions. Uh, IRC.twit.tv. A lot of them know a lot more. You know, it reminds me of a story I just read. This is wild. It actually came out from a couple of years ago. but. The buzz of electrical current in the power circuitry is often, it's barely audible or inaudible, but it is often present, if you know where to look, in videos. And apparently, I did not know this, but for 10 years, the UK government has been using, and it's, by the way, it's not consistent. It goes up and down, right? The frequency is not perfect. They've been using That's that correct. as a fingerprint in videos to authenticate them. Hmm. So the because who thought about that, huh? Who, yeah, I'll put a hummingbirdclock.info. Fascinating. It's a fingerprint in the video. It not only tells you the exact time the video is recorded, but it can tell you if it was edited. Because it should sound like this, and there's a discontinuity dis dis in there. You'll know that there was an edit point. 
Yeah. And I, I, this is in the UK, but I presume it's true everywhere. You know, we have, uh, we have. Uh, I, I would think so. Yeah, fascinating. I'm sorry, I'm not more of a, of a help for you. But I'm glad you listened, Kelly. Keep listening. Maybe somebody will come along with some good ideas. If I were you, I'd get a new power grid. Leo Laporte, Deep Tech Guy. Wasn't there a Tom Scott uh, sax player? I think there was. Hello, Rod Pyle. Hey there, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Would you like to talk about Falcon and the Dragon Crew? Uh, actually, uh, although that's interesting, I've got a couple other stories that are kind of... You know why I care? care? You know why I care? Because Why? Because it's the first, not only the first Native American in space, yes. but she's a Petaluma native. Yes, flatback, right? She comes, yeah, flatback. It means flatback, not her. The, <laughs> right. That's what Petaluma right. means. Uh, yeah. She comes from Petaluma, born in Petaluma, went to Rancho Cotati High, where Aunt Pruitt's kids go. <laughs> She's a local. Cotati's a really little town. Cotati's at tiny. Least it used to be. It still it is. Be. Yeah. Still is. So, anyway, hey, I, we're happy about I, that. I want to say, by the way, I, I was uh, driving down to my poor old boat the other day, late at night, and I was listening to. Your triangulation episode with oh, Curry wasn't Doctor that great? His, oh, his my co-author. God. It was it was fabulous, but you know my brain hurt by the time. I oh, was he's down too there smart for those us. two people. Well, yeah. both of them, yeah. yeah. But it's just like I mean, you were keeping up well. I thought, man, he is really nailing this interview. But uh, I thought if I was sitting there, I'd be there'd be these long gaps. Where I was trying to think of what to uh, ask next, right? So Corey, uh, <laughs> did really... you use a typewriter to write this book? <laughs> well, and to be able to write nonfiction and fiction. He's brilliant. As, as He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And yeah, particular yeah. ability to synthesize complex ideas, uh, to understand them deeply, and then yes. even more impressive to communicate them. Uh, that's a rare and very valuable ability. I just love Well, him. and his analogies are so great. Oh, he's brilliant. He's just, I you mean, know? he's really, truly one of the, there are not a whole lot of people I meet that I go, wow, that's a genius, and he's one of them. He's yeah. amazing. He's amazing. Well, I'm still working on it. <laughs> I figure I got about another 20 You know, I had an left. advantage because I read the book, and that, so I, yeah. uh, you know, I thank God I read the book. I actually, <laughs> <laughs> if I hadn't, I would have been uh, in deep trouble. Uh-oh, is that a fumble? Oh! Oh, hey, oh, hey, hey, hey. Sorry. I thought that's what you were I'm watching. not paying attention to anything. <laughs> if I jump up and scream. Not a problem. Oh, uh, yeah, they're giving it to Carolina. Oh, well. Oh, well. That would be football, correct? That's the skinny brown one? It's, uh, yes, it's, uh, we call, sometimes we call it hand egg. <laughs> It's sport ball. Yeah, Amy Amy uh, Webb, another genius. Yeah, I'm very... Mm -hmm. I try to get geniuses on the show, but the problem is that sometimes they're so smart um, that everybody else just kind of sits there open mouth. You know, you have to have a... The, the, yeah. the panel has to be balanced so that everybody feels like they can contribute. And when, uh, you know, Corey was on this weekend, I had Alex Kentrowitz on with him on Twit. And uh, Alex, yeah. I had Alex on because I knew he was a good counter foil to uh, Corey. And he really held his own, which is damn impressive. Damn impressive. Yeah. So, yeah, I know well, what and, you mean. And, oh, and, and as you pointed out when we started talking about this, you know, not everybody at that level of intelligence can communicate has oh. that gift. You know? Oh, look, we've got a new song for you. Oh. Hey. Oh, sorry. I thought, I thought that was the chorus. He's going to sing it. I love this song. The great, the, yeah, no, I'm waiting. I want to keep hearing it. The great Roger McGuinn heralding the appearance soon of our own spaceman, Rod Pyle. Going to talk about, there he is. <laughs> you know, Roger's a geek, Roger McGuinn. I've interviewed him many times. He lives in Florida. The last time I talked to him, he talked about how he had made his own cooling system for his computers. <laughs> he's, a, he's a wild man, a wild man, the great 12-string uh, Folk guitarist Roger McQuinn. Uh, let's move on, shall we? Walter on the line from Los Angeles. Hello, Walter. Hey, Walter, you're on. Oh. Hey, welcome to the show. What can I do for you? Yes, uh, I have a, about a 600 square foot uh, apartment, and I'm using uh, AT&T's combo router. I want to turn the Wi-Fi off and hook up a... 
Netgear Wi-Fi 6 model AX1800. Okay. Router. So this is often the case, you know, your ISP, and it, most people just say, okay, fine. Uh, uh, I want to be able to control it. It uses the Netgear um, software. Yeah, yeah. So is it, uh, you said AT&T. Is it fiber? Is it DSL? How are you connected? Do you know? It says DSL. DSL, okay. So it's a phone line that's giving you your internet access. So for that, AT&T provides you with an interface that takes the signal from the phone line, decodes it, and turns it into a network interface. And since they gave you the combo router, it's nice. You don't have to you know, do anything else to it. You could just, it's Wi-Fi and you just join the Wi-Fi. But there are two separate things going on. That's why they call it a combo. And as, as you pointed out, you do want the AT&T interface to the DSL, but you don't necessarily want to use their router. You might want to provide your own, perfectly acceptable to do that. Often it's a better router than the AT&T router or the Comcast router or the Cox router, whatever they give you, the ISP provided. So the trick on this is, the at and combo is doing something called network address translation. It's the thing that assigns IP addresses to the computers and devices inside the house. You want to turn that off because you don't want two things doing that. So you want to put the at and combo router in bridge mode. Check your manual for how to do that. And then connect your net, net, net gear and everything should work just fine. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Rod Pyle, coming up. So it, you'll have to check with AT&T or maybe they've given you a manual uh, on how to do that. Sometimes they don't let you do that. Uh, but check the, you know, you can log into your combo, right, from the from the web. They give you a web address for that? Yeah. Yeah. So log into it. And what you're going to look for is a setting that says put it in bridge mode. Okay. Uh, once it's in bridge mode then it's not doing any routing. It's not doing that NAT address translation, network address translation. It's not doing any routing. And so then you can connect to the Ethernet port on that with your Netgear and then let the Netgear do the routing. What you don't want is to have both of them doing routing. It's called double NAT. It's not good. It's not the worst. It's not the end of the world, but it causes kind of unexpected problems. So it's best if you can put the router into bridge mode. Uh, if not, if you can't, I suspect you can, but if you can't, then you can put your new Netgear into bridge mode. Say, I don't want you to do DHCP. Let the ATT do that, but I do want you to do the Wi-Fi. You'll also, by the way, I forgot to mention this, want to turn off the Wi-Fi radios on the combo. So all of that is going to require access to those settings once you log in. Uh, the chat room is giving me some links. Um turn off Wi-Fi on a gateway. Let me look and see if this is easy to do. Uh, if you have access to the device configuration, it's in Home Network Wi-Fi Advanced Options. So you'll have to go into the, this is an advanced option. And uh, turn off the Home SSID enable and the Guest SSID enable. I'll put this uh, article in the show notes so oh, you great. can refer to great. it. Um, so you go to 192.168.1.1, log in with the password that's on the combo router, and then you have to dig through the settings, and you want to turn off the Wi-Fi, turn off uh, routing, put it in bridge mode, and then your Netgear can do all of that. It's going to do the Wi-Fi and the routing. Great. Got it? Thanks, sir. My pleasure, Walter. Have a great day. It's time to talk space with Mr. Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of the Ad Astra Magazine, the official magazine of the National Space Society. Subscribe at space.nss.org. And the host of our podcast, This Week in Space, with Tarek Malik of space.com. Rod uh, is also the author of many great books about space. And we always love seeing him on the show. Hi, Rod. Good to Even see you. Even without a cool hat. Well, or worse, without you're not no. in your space capsule. Usually you're in your... Uh, <laughs> Usually you're on Mars or something. Yeah, well, we're doing a little remodeling here. <laughs> no green the screen The studio's today. been compromised for a while, yeah. <laughs> That's oh. all right. It's radio. Only I saw it anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> there you go. It's fine. Well, What's... no, you and about 500 other people. Yeah, well, some people watch the watch the video stream. Yeah, there's, that Yeah, happens. I was watching yeah. it earlier today. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. It so, brings uh, you into my living room. Yes. And, and I do appreciate it. 
And if you don't mind, next time I'm there, could you bring me a beer? Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, what's yeah, happening in space? Well, as you pointed out, we just had a SpaceX launch a Crew-5 on October 5th. I was very proud for, because uh, yes. it was an interesting crew. It had one person from Japan, one person from Russia, and that two from America. Deal. And the commander of the Dragon Crew-5 was a woman uh, from Petaluma, our little town here. Nicole Anapu Man. Also the first Native American uh, in space. So that's really cool. And a Stanford graduate. Well, okay, if you want to represent. I think there are a few no. Stanford graduates who've been to space, I would guess. Yeah, I know, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> uh, so. Anyway, she she and the crew are on the space station right now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And they're there for about that, that craft will rotate for five months. I assume they're all staying that long, wow. but uh, they do sometimes stagger the returns. I have to say, uh, one of the, I, you know, for all yeah. the fun we make of Elon and for all the nuttiness he adds to our lives, that SpaceX is pretty amazing. Oh. I mean, to watch that yeah. launch go flawlessly after Artemis couldn't even, yeah. you know, get to countdown, uh, and then to watch the first stage booster fly itself autonomously yeah. back to Earth yeah. and land perfectly on that barge, and, and then everything just goes flawlessly, and it makes you forget how hard this is. He's well, so and, good. And, and he makes it look easy, and this was after decades of the big aerospace companies trying to do similar things and not making the cut. So when you, you're you right, when you, especially when the Falcon Heavy launched in 2018, when those two side boosters touched down at the same time. Wasn't moment, that mind-boggling? I got Of course, chills. the internet lights up. It's fake. It's all fake. Oh, you know, please. it's like, no. Sorry, it's real. And now, so this booster uh, was another, uh, sorry, not this booster, the one that launched the other day, another 14-flight veteran. So he's just pushing every engineering limit there is on every front. And yeah. if Starship works, man, we are there. So one other thing that's interesting about this mission, of course, is you touched, well, there's two, actually. One is Russian cosmonauts. So we did make another seat trade in the middle of this hot war. This, this is the first time in, uh, that a Russian has launched from U.S. soil. Is that right? Uh, a shuttle, I think. Yeah, but, maybe in a shuttle, but okay. in a in a in, in this in this run of stuff, it's certainly in a private spacecraft. Yeah, and also two of these astronauts, or sorry, three of the astronauts were reassigned from the Boeing Starliner, which still isn't rated wow. for crew yet. Wow. So you know that's not a happy fact, but there you go. Uh, another news item: Goodbye, Mom. India's uh, Mars orbiting mission, or Mom, ran out of gas. Dark. Ran well, out of gas. maybe. Oh. You know, they, they made that announcement. The ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, said it wasn't working. That was one reason that popped up They on, on the Internet. They did not say exactly what had gone wrong until a little later. They made some suggestions. Apparently, a depletion of maneuvering fuel and the fact that it had gone through two solar eclipses, as seen from Mars, one of them was over seven hours, Uh and the batteries on that thing, they're solar recharged, but they're only rated for two hours of continuous discharge. So we think it just ran the power down. But this mission lasted for over eight years. It was That's, originally supposed yeah, to go six months. Yeah, they didn't expect months. more, right? I mean, this is normal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. and it was an engineering mission more than anything else. I mean, yeah. it did some science, but it was a very high orbit, and it was really an engineering look-what-we-can-do mission. Uh, yeah, and that said, not to minimize their achievement at all, they're only the fourth country to make it to Martian orbit, and the first first one to do so successfully and the whole mission was about 72 73 million dollars including all the wow. control and everything they did get some help from nasa jpl was a partner but uh that's about a third of what it would have cost to do it here domestically big part of that was because 30 percent of their executive staff were women and a larger percentage as i recall of the technical staff the actual people that built and configured the thing were women and they work very long hours and, you know, like a lot of other places, get paid less than men. So, you know, it's a great triumph that so many women were involved. Now you just got to crank up their pay. I, I just months. think it's, uh, you know, space shouldn't be owned by any one country. It should be apolitical. And I just think it's great. I uh, Yeah. You know, and we could all cooperate with one another. Uh, even in this case, as, as much as Russia has become a pariah state, even with Russia, as long as it's space. You know, it's not. Yeah, it's not uh, warmongering. It's space. I think that you know, 
it, we're all together on one planet. <laughs> Let's yeah, not forget. and so something, you know, the great white hope here might be uh, asteroid interdiction. So we know that we're in danger from an asteroid strike at some point. We just had the. Dark I saw them say that there's a there's an asteroid that. headed our way. Is that just a. Yeah, there's always an asteroid oh, okay. headed our way. It, it's a okay. matter of how big it is and how how wide it's going to pass. Most of them pass well outside of uh, the moon's orbit. So was the really... uh, was the DART mission where we we launched a satellite against a uh, a rock uh, successful uh, in their opinion? Did it move the rock? Well, Technically, it was successful, so it, it hit well, the rock. Well, I saw it crash. Still, <laughs> right, that was quite a quite a shot. But, but did it um, move the rock is the question. Well, they're still trying to figure it out, and as we got closer and closer to Dimorphos, which was that little 500-foot mm -hmm. moonlet, it began looking like suspiciously like it was a rubble pile asteroid, not a solid rock. Oh. Rubble piles are exactly what it they sound like. It certainly made a, a mess. gravel we, we, held by gravity. It yeah. left a big trail, and there was a big... Exp so yeah. maybe it was just a bunch of gravel that we... Well, up. and and that brings up another point, which is, you know, one of the other things we have to learn besides how to move the big rocks is how to influence the trajectory of a rubble pile or a gravel asteroid. Well, well yeah, but even without if, just making it fly apart, because then you just got a potentially bunch, a, a bunch, bunch of little of ones. Parts. Yeah, littler, but still dangerous, right? You don't so want you, want you don't want out, even if it's a gravel pile, you don't want it to hit us. You, no, yeah, uh, not unless it's, if it's really gravel, you know, if they're really the size of marbles or less. But if you've got really big rocks chunks together, that's yeah. bad. So that's why. So this this approach, the direct impact kinetic impactor, would be for good for solid rocks. When you've got a rubble pile, if then that's what, what it do? turns out this was, you want to influence the trajectory of it indirectly. So uh. they have what they call tractor influencing oh you a need a tractor beam we just send the enterprise with its beam. tractor beam no, no 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 it got a spacecraft big enough that it kind of over time drags it off course or potentially uh there's there's other interdictions you might be able to but you have to be gentle to you have it. to you nudge have to it you gentle. can't hit it yeah you have to be sweet and loving to it. Yeah. <laughs> so p um, so tuesday nasa is going to have a press conference we'll find out yeah i yeah. guess how successful this was we still don't and I'll, I'll know for be sure tuned in for sure p didimos and, uh, i call it p didimos in honor <laughs> of uh, p diddy the puff, of course the you puffster, do okay. the puff daddy yeah how much long how much longer do we have you got 54 seconds oh hunting exoplanets there's a site called <gasps> zootopia so which cool lets you join in citizen science along with uh scientists working on the test program which was a telescope that identified a majority of the 500 Five thousand confirmed Vectus planets we've seen. So a company that makes telescopes called the Unistellar got together with Zootopia and NASA and said, "Let's let the citizens get involved." So if you go on Zootopia.com, you can check it out, and you can join into the effort with your own telescope, assuming you have one that's large enough to is work. Is that just you know pretending that citizen astronomy no. is real? No. No, it's actually been really helpful because there's so much data coming down from oh, these good. probes that the okay. NASA people don't have time to go through it so all. You really yeah. can't help. You Rod can. Pyle, space.nss.org to subscribe Thank to you, sir. Ad Astra. And join him on Twists every week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And right here, of course, every week. Of course. Of course. P. Didymos. P. Didymos. That's how I remember the name. Yeah, that's very good. P. Didymos. Good. He's the mostest... Yeah, if you look at Zootopia, they've got probably, gosh, 20 or 30 different programs ranging from oceanography to yes. oh, uh, yeah. we visited climate them. change. We've talked yeah. about them before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they've done galaxy categorizations and looking at clouds on Mars and all kinds of cool stuff. So It's it, not Zootopia.com because you know, that says, may the zoo be with you. I don't think that's Zootopia.com. Oops. Oh, doggone it. I Dog keep it doggone it. It's, uh, yeah. It's Zootopia zoo. Science. Let me Google that. Zoo. No, it's not Zootopia. It's another. Uh, it isn't. That's a movie that. with a with no. the sloths in it and the DMV lady. Uh, I'll correct room. myself next week. I'm sorry. <laughs> Zoolander? What is no. the name of it, chat room? Help. Help, chat room. Bluesteel.com? So what is it? Zootopia. That's hysterical. I can't believe it. I'll correct that. it if somebody gives me the real one. Let's see. Help NASA exoplanets. Uh, let me look this up. Zoo. Uh, maybe that'll... You know, it's all about... It's all about the uh, <laughs> citizen science. 
Zooniverse. Zooniverse. There we go. Zootopia. If you'd done that to Bill Handel, he would have <laughs> murdered you. Oh, my God. Well, that's why I'm only on once a month now. <laughs> you know, you never know what you're going to get with Bill either. You get on there, and, and usually, you know, he's, he's especially with science, he's very forthcoming, he's generous, he's great. But some mornings, as I'm sure you know, you get the other Bill, Depends right? on his hemorrhoid situation. <laughs> Is that it? No, I don't know. I, I haven't talked right. to Bill in a long time. I love Bill, but uh, he yeah. uh, he stopped having me on his show years ago. People-powered yeah. research. Welcome to the Zooniverse. Zooniverse. All right, I'll correct, yeah, I'll correct that when we get back. Thank you. Thank you. Because I really appreciate that. Rod's been drinking That's again. That's a big difference. Day drinking again, Rod, I tell you. I don't drink anymore. I can't handle <laughs> I'm it. I'm teasing you. Neither you do know, I, I you know? Age. When I heard you say that, I thought, yeah, exactly. Age. One drink, and I'm just a stupid fool in the corner. And bad the next jokes. day, even if it's just one glass of wine, I feel like yeah. crap. Yeah. It used to be and I'd plus, never get hangovers. I when I was a young guy, I thought hangovers. So nobody, what's that? They're making that up. Now it's Dr. like Dr. Mom Grandma said piles affecting piles. First one P I L E S <laughs> meaning hemorrhoids. I can't believe that. Oh my god. Well, and the other thing about drinking is, and I'm sure you remember this from, you know, being in bars and you were younger, although I'm following Lisa's social media and it looks like you guys are out eating just about every night. We but. went we went to a caviar bar, but she, I, she, I drink water. She drinks yeah. champagne because I'm the designated driver. Yeah, I'm the designator, designated non And by um, the way, I never house, yeah. post what I'm doing or where I've been, but I, I know I have no privacy because <laughs> Lisa... <laughs> outs me every time but what is it about so many guys that when they drink they want to fight oh i know you know i just get kind of Actually, sappy and maudlin lisa used and, to be like know. that she'd get she'd get very what? pugnacious yeah i guess i could <laughs> not anymore that. Just say that. not anymore no but she used yeah. to she used to when when i when we first met she'd have a couple of drinks she'd, she'd start hitting me <laughs> she'd be she'd be a formidable opponent with those she's muscles, much you know? stronger than early on and i would i'm just kidding but early on in our relationship yeah. She she said, "Let's wrestle." And uh, and pin. <laughs> and now me. wait, that's a very promising and, early and, indicator. And, in well, we were already you know together, but she, she pinned yeah. me, and I couldn't move. And I realized at that time, this woman is uh, much stronger than I am. <laughs> and uh, we've never you know we've never discussed. And she it knows since. where you sleep every night. Yeah, so it's <laughs> thank important you, Rod. to keep her happy. Have a Thanks, great sir. week. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you for letting me be your tech guy again, Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy Show every weekend, thanks to Professor Laura, our musical director. She does such a good job, doesn't she, with the the intervening interval music? And, of course, thanks to Kim Schaffer, our phone angel. She gets answers the phones, gets you on the air. Thanks most of all, though, because I couldn't do it without you. Actually, I should really thank not only you, the listeners. I really appreciate it and all the people who call in. But let's not forget, you couldn't listen if it weren't for all those great radio stations. So thanks to all of them and those program directors all across the Fruited Plain, coast to coast, who say, it sounds like foreign language programming to me, but I guess we need a tech show. Thank you. You're right. And I'll try to speak English. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, I think of myself as a geek translator. Kind of. <laughs> Joe is on the line from Rebel Stroke, Rebel Stoke. British Columbia. What a great name. Rebel Stoke. Wow. I love BC. Uh, I'm not familiar with Rebel Stoke. It's about six hours away from Vancouver eastward. East of Vancouver. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We used to go to, I used to go to Vancouver once a, once a month for about a week to do a TV show up there. And I just love BC. Um, I'm Whistler's beautiful, but I've never been to Rebel Stoke. Are there rebels in Rebel Stoke? Oh, I'm sure there are, but they stay pretty quiet around here. It's, it's <laughs> populations like maximum 10,000 people. Nice. I'm sure it's paradise. And, BC is beautiful. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It is. What can I do to help you? Okay, so we have a very old 2011 Intel Pentium computer. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, G6951 processor is the code name. Um, it's for my aunt's sister, who's had it, but it's Windows isn't doing so well on it anymore. No. Not Email isn't working anymore. Uh, web browsers can't be updated. Yeah. Kind of 
What version um, of Windows does she have on there? Just out of curiosity. It must be XP, right? No, 10. It got to 10. Oh, good. Originally it was 7, but it got to 10, and now things are yeah. slowly not working. So the other, so there are a number of things to talk about, not merely the processor. In fact, frankly, in 10 years, processors haven't gotten all that much faster. But how much RAM did it come with? I bet 4 gigs. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And that's really, nowadays, that's very, very low. It's kind of, it's not below the minimum. It is the minimum. But you'd sure like yep. 8 or 16. 16 is kind of the sweet spot uh, in RAM these days. The other thing that tends to happen with these computers from of that vintage is they have hard drives in them, those spinning disks. And those oh, yeah. things, that poor guy has been going around 5,400 revolutions per minute for the last 12 years. It's getting tired. And oh, yeah. uh, most likely the reason it's slow is just the hard drive is unreliable. What Windows or all operating systems will do, if they, they'll try to read a sector, if it doesn't come back with with data, they'll go, well, let me try that again. And you can imagine if it does that every sector, that's one half speed. And if it has to do it more than twice per sector, that's even less. So the first thing that goes is a hard drive. If yeah. you could put more memory in that computer, and if you could replace the spinning drive with a solid state drive, it might actually be pretty usable. It could be pretty usable, but what we were thinking is, like, I'm going to get a new hard drive for it for her, for sure, because she's been running it so long, but swapping Linux on it, because I'm sure Windows and all that other stuff isn't going to work much longer. Yeah, and I'm, you know, and I'll never tell somebody not to use Linux. I, it's a free, uh, open-source operating system, uh, I think, is every bit as good as Windows. In fact, maybe in many cases, better, more secure, more privacy-respecting. Um and they make versions of Linux designed for four gigs of RAM. And that's uh, the thing, like, I'm looking, and that's my biggest thing right now is what one. Yeah. Like, there's Puppy. There's Puppy. Uh, there's X Ubuntu. Uh, there's Damn Small Linux. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that one. <laughs> so if you go to um, distrowatch.org, that's where all the distributions of Linux, all the various versions of Linux are listed. And you can browse there and look for one that's designed for older slower systems for for 16 bit you know and four gigs of ram you'll definitely want to you know i would say dollars to donuts the real problem is this is the hard drive so you'll definitely want to put an ssd in there that'll make a big difference by itself i st oh, even yeah. even with uh, a, a a small linux four gigs well, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I, I run Linux in one gig on a Raspberry Pi, so it absolutely is possible to do so. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there are a number. Um, if you like Ubuntu, um, which is still probably the number one uh, distribution in the world, X Ubuntu is designed to be smaller. I don't know if they still support 16-bit small RAM systems. That used to be the... The, the the low memory version, older yeah. computer version. So X-U-B-U-N-T-U dot org, one to look at. There's also L Ubuntu. Um, yep. So those are all, you know, worth trying. The nice thing you can do with all of these is put them on a USB key and boot to the USB key, if that, if that computer will, uh, boot to the uh -huh. USB key. Yeah, it has the option in the BIOS. But Good. Like I, said, I haven't. I haven't. So the advantage of that is you don't have to install it to see how is it going to work. Now remember, drive access can be super slow because you're doing it on a USB drive, USB yeah. key. But when it's in RAM, when it's running, you'll see how usable it is and if everything works and all that. And I always recommend doing that before you install it. Although nowadays it's so much easier to install Linux, frankly, than it is Windows. It's it's usually just a few minutes. So uh, L Ubuntu is also designed for very, very small computers. Puppy Linux, you've seen them all. Um, yeah. It's just a good idea to download and put it on a USB key and boot to it just to see what happens. Okay, yeah. And like I say, it's just going to be the transition for her from Windows to Linux. That's going to be hard, right. And as I said, if you put another 8 gigs of RAM in, uh, or better yet, another 12 gigs of RAM in and a better hard drive. It, Windows 10 probably would run just fine. I'm, I'm yeah, guessing. The problem is, like, I can't update Chrome on it anymore. No, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, uh, you know, this is the other thing. Windows 10 isn't all the same. Microsoft doesn't mm -hmm. even support older versions of Windows 10. So, you know, it depends yeah. which version of Windows 10. Yeah, try L U B U N T U dot net. It's really designed to be for minimal, as light as it can be. Very low hardware requirements. That's another yeah. good choice. Probably the first one I'd try. And it looks a lot like Windows. She, it depends on, you know, how much she relies on muscle memory. Um, you know, how, how much she can learn. But honestly, well, if you set it up right, I think Linux is a better operating system for uh, novices, believe it or not. Yeah, well, the other problem is the memory with her as well. She's uh, losing it a bit. So yeah. Make it as easy as possible for her. You know, if, you, if this doesn't work, get a Chromebook or an iPad. Oh, no, my uh, my aunt, well, my uncle here has a Chromebook, so she's been using that for now. For, for, for most people, and I don't just mean older people like me, uh, but for most people, they live on the browser. And, you know, as you said, if Chrome doesn't work, <laughs> they can't use it. That's all a Chromebook is, is the Chrome browser. Yeah. And it's more secure, more reliable, and it's simpler because it's just the browser. Same thing with an iPad. Older people... Uh, my mom, 89 years old, loves her iPad, loves it. And she, you know, she's got a Mac. She, she's got everything. Of course, she's my mom, but she lives on that iPad. I think there's a lot to be said for these operating systems designed really just to get the work done and not, you know, not for enthusiasts. They're for people who just want to use a computer. Hey, a pleasure talking to you, Joe. Thank, I think it's great that you're helping out on that. That's fantastic. And I think it's great that you all listened and called and, and, and all of that. I really appreciate it. Getting to spend some time with you every week. Well, I'll be, I'll be back next week. Um, maybe by then I'll be saying, "Hey, the Apple event's coming up." We'll see. I put it, I'm putting a bet on that. Uh, I bet you something. This uh, this fine dead hard drive. <laughs> Apple will announce an event this week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. I'll see you next time. Well, that's it for the tech guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.